As you can see, they're still setting up for the hearing, and that's Congressman Donald Payne. Looks like he's about to begin the session. Good morning. The meeting of the Subcommittee on Human Resources and Intergovernmental Relations will, of the Government Operations Committee will come to order. My name is Donald Payne, and I'm chairman of the subcommittee. I will open the meeting with an opening statement. Today in Washington, D.C., and in much of the country, attention is focused on presidential politics. But even as we prepare to make this very important decision about the future of our country, there are very other critical issues that cannot be ignored at this time. Lives and the quality of lives are at stake. Two days ago, we held a hearing in Newark, New Jersey, to focus on the TB epidemic and the new drug-resistant strain that are affecting a number of our urban centers. Today, we will examine the role of the federal government in the battle against breast cancer. Breast cancer has claimed the lives of friends or relatives of virtually everyone in this country. In the next 10 years, another one and a half million women are expected to be diagnosed with breast cancer. Poor women are especially likely to die because of their limited access to health care. But women of every income, age, and ethnic group can fall victim to this terrible epidemic. Last December, our subcommittee held a hearing on the lack of progress against breast cancer. We strongly urge the National Institutes of Health to do more to prevent the disease. But we also expressed our concern about a major prevention study that was under consideration at NCI using a toxic chemotherapy drug, tamoxifen. At today's hearing, we will focus on that $68 million tamoxifen study, which is now well underway. In the last year, new research has been published about the dangers of tamoxifen. In fact, public health service experts have long believed the study could expose women to risks that outweigh the likely benefits. The public health service has a tarnished record in the past regarding the ethical treatment of patients in federally funded research. The most infamous example is the Tuskegee study where more than 400 African American men with syphilis were studied for 40 years but not given the treatment that could cure their disease. At least 28 died and many more became seriously ill before that study was stopped in 1972. The outrage that followed the exposure of the Tuskegee study resulted in stronger protections for people who participated and participated in federally funded research. However, there are still loopholes in those protections, and even today's patients are sometimes misled about the risks and benefits of medical treatment being studied with taxpayers' money. There are ethical questions in prevention research that are different from those in other studies. First of all, how big a risk is acceptable for healthy patients? Secondly, is it fair to give a drug to a healthy woman for the rest of their lives if no research has been done on such long-term uses? At today's hearing, we will attempt to answer the following questions. Number one, are patients in this study accurately informed of the risks and benefits of tamoxifen? Two, are the women in the study at high enough risk of breast cancer to justify the use of a toxic drug that could possibly kill or injure them? Three, is there enough research evidence to justify giving tamoxifen to premenopausal women in this prevention study? And four, what are we going to learn from this study? We have an impressive list of witnesses, which includes officials of the Public Health Service and other well-respected physicians and scientists from around the country, as well as women who have personal experience with tamoxifen or with this study. We all look forward to hearing the testimony from our witnesses. Uh, before introducing our panel, although he just came in, I would like to yield to my distinguished colleague from 
New York, Representative Major Owens, for any remarks that he would like to make at this time. Mr. Chairman, I have no opening statement except to congratulate you on going forward with these hearings, despite the fact that others of our colleagues are out doing many other things. You are here on the front lines, and I uh, want to congratulate you for that. Thank you, and I appreciate you taking the time out from your busy schedule to join us here. Uh, my distinguished colleague, Mr. Thomas, of uh, the ranking minority uh, member, has a statement for the record, which will be included without objection. As is custom, as it is the custom of the Government Operations Committee, all witnesses before the committee will be sworn in. From time to time during the hearing, we will be inserting into the record without objections documents relevant to this matter. Before we begin, let me say to all of our witnesses that the full text of your written statements will be inserted in the hearing record. We have asked you each to summarize your testimony in five minutes, so there will be time for questions after each panel's presentation. Let me now welcome our first panel of witnesses and ask you to take your places behind your nameplate on the witness table. Our first panel includes Nancy Evans from San Francisco and Sybil Fine Fanberg from Ch Chevy Chase, Maryland. If you two would come forward. And remain standing. To raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. Uh, let the record indicate that both witnesses answered in the affirmative. I want to thank you both for your willingness to participate in today's hearing. We will ask uh, each of you to testify, and we will have questions when you have completed your prepared testimony. Uh, Ms. Evans, we will begin with you. Thank you. My name is Nancy Evans, and I am a medical writer and editor in San Francisco. In addition, I am Vice President of Breast Cancer Action, a San Francisco advocacy group of breast cancer survivors and their supporters. I was diagnosed with breast cancer in January 1991. I was 53 years old. My tumor was 1.2 centimeters, classified as infiltrating ductal carcinoma and estrogen receptor positive. After talking with two surgeons and an oncologist, I elected to have a lumpectomy and axillary node dissection, followed by radiation. There was no apparent spread of the cancer to the lymph nodes, thus no chemotherapy was recommended. Because my tumor was estrogen receptor positive in February 1991, my oncologist prescribed tamoxifen as extra insurance against recurrence. Within a month, I began to notice both emotional and physiologic changes. I experienced a loss of concentration, poor short-term memory, mood swings, and frequent periods of depression. I cried easily, and all of this interfered with my work and my personal life. When reading, even for pleasure, my eyes recognized the words, but at the end of the page, I had no recollection of what I had read. Prior to taking tamoxifen, I had experienced only mild symptoms of menopause. Occasional hot flashes, mood swings, and night sweats. Tamoxifen exacerbated all these symptoms dramatically and added something new, insomnia, a totally new experience for me. My internal thermostat was erratic, moving from hot flashes to chills, making it difficult to know how to dress and be comfortable. At my follow-up visits in June, I consulted both my surgeon and my radiotherapist about the symptoms, particularly the effect on my concentration and memory. And I asked if those symptoms were common. They said no, but if I was having that kind of a reaction to the drug, I might want to consider stopping it, that probably I would be all right without it based on the small size of my tumor and my node negative status. Within a few weeks after I stopped taking the drug, the symptoms disappeared. 
Later, I was talking with a friend who also had breast cancer, and she volunteered the information that tamoxifen had been prescribed for her, but that she stopped taking it due to symptoms similar to mine. I recall her saying, I've lived in the same house for 25 years, and yet I couldn't remember how to get home. My daughter told me later that I would call her at work several times a day and have the same conversation each time without realizing it. When this happened repeatedly, she recognized that something was very wrong and thought it might be the medication. So my friend stopped taking tamoxifen, just as I had, and her symptoms disappeared. That validated my belief that tamoxifen had indeed caused my earlier symptoms. And while these side effects were not life-threatening, they certainly threatened the quality of my life sufficiently to decide that I was better off without the drug. This sequence of events occurred prior to my joining Breast Cancer Action and prior to reading about the breast cancer prevention trial. As a representative of Breast Cancer Action, I want to express our concern about the trial based on our reading of the National Women's Health Network's analysis and our own meeting with Dr. Craig Henderson of the University of California, San Francisco. Though Dr. Henderson approves of giving postmenopausal women tamoxifen, he expresses concern that many premenopausal women without breast cancer are getting tamoxifen in this new study. Both the patients who are demanding it because they are worried and women at high risk to develop breast cancer. Dr. Henderson said tamoxifen just might turn out to be the DES of the 90s. And as you probably know, DES was used widely between 1941 and 1947 and 1971 to treat threatened abortion and subsequently a clear relationship between fetal DES exposure and vaginal carcinoma was discovered. Breast Cancer Action is also concerned that the recruitment brochure for the trial seems to have failed to provide complete information about the side effects of tamoxifen. There is additional documentation included with my written testimony. Thank you very much, and that will be entered into the record. Uh, Ms. Feinberg. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Sybil Feinberg. I am pleased to be able to tell my experiences regarding tamoxifen study. I believe I am at high risk for breast cancer because I am postmenopausal. I have had three biopsies, and my twin sister recently developed breast cancer. For years, I have been following reports about tamoxifen. I could hardly wait for it to be available as a preventative for breast cancer. Women like me, interested in the tamoxifen study, are women who are particularly concerned about getting breast cancer. We are looking for ways to reduce our chances of getting this disease. We reach out for hopeful solutions. Therefore, we may be particularly vulnerable. Early this year, the tamoxifen study was announced. I attended the seminar for prospective participants. The meeting was scheduled to last two hours. I was very surprised and concerned that one and a half hours were devoted to general information about breast cancer, which I and probably many others present in the audience already knew. Only the last 30 minutes dealt with specific information about tamoxifen. The discussion was superficial. It painted a very rosy picture of benefits and minimized side effects. I went away feeling that I was not provided with enough information to make an informed decision on whether or not to participate in the study. Nevertheless, I placed myself on the list as a possible participant. Later in May, I read in Science News that some scientists had reported in Lancet magazine serious liver complications among patients taking tamoxifen. I read the Lancet report. On my next appointment for a routine exam, 
with the doctor who is the project director of the local study, I asked what she thought of this article. I was surprised that she was unaware of the work. I was stunned by her remark, oh, we don't get Lancet. She dismissed the article, which she had not read, with the statement, the woman probably died of advanced cancer. This did little to reassure me about the study director's concern and interest in learning about possible serious side effects in the use of tamoxifen. At the very beginning, when a woman expresses interest in the study, she should be provided with a written description of the purposes of the study, of the protocol, and of the possible side effects. Only in this way can she make an informed decision. This woman should know that she will be given a drug that is chemotherapy, not an aspirin. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Evans, let me start uh, with a few questions to you. Before you started taking tamoxifen, did your doctors describe the possible side effects that you later experienced? No, they did not. The symptoms you described would not be considered serious in the informed consent form. Would you describe them as serious? They were not serious in terms of being life-threatening. However, they very seriously affected my life. Not to be able to sleep, not to be able to remember are pretty uh, serious when much of what you do for a living um, rests on reading. Hey, the, uh, the current informed consent form for the Tamoxifen Breast Cancer Prevention Study lists depression, confusion, and fatigue as possible side effects and says that adverse reactions are rarely severe enough to require stopping treatment. It does not go into any detail about how these symptoms might affect the person. Do you think that the form, in your opinion, should provide more detail about how the drug can affect a woman's life, these other things that you mentioned uh, entered into the quality of your life? I certainly do. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Feinberg, let me ask you, when you first considered participating in this prevention study, how much did you know about the risks of tamoxifen? Very little. I have a copy of the informed consent form used at Georgetown. Uh, I must say that it is better than many consent forms used in this study, but it does not include some important information. For example, it does not include new evidence that the prescribed dosage could cause eye damage. It also fails to mention the new research findings on liver damage. Did you receive this consent form from Georgetown? Uh, no, I have not as yet received it. Uh, and I have uh, expressed my interest in participating in the study many months ago. When do you think they should have given you this information? I think this information should have been given immediately before a seminar which then could answer questions that people uh, would have raised from reading the information. Uh, would you describe what you think the informed consent process should be so that people are totally informed and feel that they have been uh, given all the information? Well, I feel that, again, as soon as the, the woman expresses interest in the study, she should be given complete information about all the risks, all the benefits, whether rare or not, so that she can read and uh, have available to her uh, the literature in order to make a right decision for herself. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Rollins, do you have any questions? This time? Just briefly, Mr. Chairman, in the same vein, uh, Ms. Feinberg, would you characterize what happened to you as being the result of incompetence or uh, deception? The re people who were conducting this study and recruiting people, was it just incompetence that led them to spend an hour and a half in a general discussion which everybody, uh, about facts about cancer everybody knew and then only half an hour in the first study itself and left you feeling uh, insecure? I don't think it's incompetence. I, I think everybody was, is so excited about this. Everybody is on a roll about the, the drug at the beginning. And uh, I think they 
they didn't think about it. Uh, I know that in other areas this was dealt with very differently. If it's a matter of incompetence versus deception, you say it's not deception. It's not, I don't, well, no deliberate yeah, deception. I guess, I guess. You want to be in high, no high pressured sales techniques to get you into something? Yeah, I guess, I guess we would have to say, I hate to use a strong term as deception. I don't think people meant to deceive you, but they, uh, they didn't give the information that they had to have known, they should know. They, I, one would assume that the people directing the study have access to every piece of literature and uh, are informed before they would even be involved in, in the research. So you would say that it's, it's possible certainly to put together a better package to make women understand fully what's involved here and that that should be done Absolutely. in the interest of going forward Absolutely. study. Thank you. Well, let me thank both of you very much for your valuable testimony. Appreciate you. Let me now welcome our next panel of witnesses, Dr. Art Kaplan, Director of the Center for Biomedical Ethics at the University of Minnesota, Dr. Adrian Fu Bergen, Medical Advisor to the National Women's Health Network, Dr. Michael De Gregorio, Professor of Oncology at the University of Texas Medical Center at San Antonio, Dr. Helen Rodriguez Trias, President-elect of the American Public Health Association, and Dr. Stephen P. N. Tedosi, uh, Director of Biostatistics at the Oncology Center at John Hopkins Medical Center. If you would take your positions at the witness table, we can then proceed. Before you all sit down, would you stand, please? Raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to thank you all for taking time from your very busy schedules to be with us today at this very important hearing. Because of the large number of witnesses, I will ask each of you to try to summarize your prepared statement in five minutes so that there will be plenty of time for questions. As I've indicated before, the uh, entire statement will be inserted into the hearing record. Uh, Dr. Kaplan, uh, would you uh, please begin? Thank you. It's a uh, pleasure to have this opportunity to talk about the issues raised by the uh, chemotherapy prevention study concerning breast cancer and as you noted when uh, the hearing began uh, one of the reasons uh, that it's important to think carefully about this study uh, has to do with the history of research involving human subjects the uh, fact is that 20 years ago almost to the day uh, hearings were being organized concerning another public health service study uh, that involved uh, monitoring the course of syphilis in African-American men. Uh, these men were uh, not told that they had the disease. These men were allowed to go untreated when treatment was available. And uh, I mention this not so much uh, to contrast the studies, but to point out that it is from uh, the situation that existed in the so-called Tuskegee study that the protections derive for human subjects today. I think those protections can be summarized uh, very quickly under two frameworks. First, we now know and believe that all subjects in any research must participate as a result of their free and voluntary consent. You cannot justify putting people into research, offering them the chance to be involved in research unless they really understand the risk-benefit ratio that they're being asked to face. And secondly, the research must pass muster with scientific peers, with the scientific community. It does not uh, uh, pass muster to ask people to bear risks unless the questions that uh, a study proposes to address are going to get answered in the course of the study. We learn those lessons from Tuskegee, that we can't do things to people unless we get their permission. We understand that they need to know exactly what's going to happen to them, what the risks and benefits are that they face, and that studies have to be well designed so as to assure that the questions that are asked are going to get answered if we're going to impose risk on someone. Let me simply say what I think the bottom line is concerning 
the uh, National Cancer Institute tamoxifen study. I think it boils very simply down to the question, is it right to impose risk on healthy women? Is it right to ask women to take a substance, to take a drug that carries known risks uh, in the hope of finding an answer to the question concerning prevention? I'm going to uh, do something somewhat unusual for ethicists who often get accused of having more hands than even economists. Uh, I'll try to be one-handed and uh, answer that question. Uh, it seems to me the question of is the tamoxifen study ethical uh, might find uh, the objection raised that it's never acceptable to put people through risk if they're healthy, if they don't have some reason to uh, uh, need to be involved in research. I want to answer that that objection is false. It seems to me that uh, it is not true that it is always wrong to ask people uh, to uh, not do studies if they're going to impose risk, that that is a position that runs against the idea that people can judge for themselves what risks and benefits they want to face, what sort of computation they want to make in deciding uh, what to do about the uh, threat of breast cancer, they should be allowed to decide whether or not they want to face those risks. So I don't think the answer to the question, is it ethical if it imposes risk, is to simply say, well, we can't do research that involves the imposition of risk. The reason we have to pay attention carefully to this study is that, as far as I can tell, it is the first effort in this country, if not in the world, to try and use a uh, drug to prevent a serious disease when the drug carries known risk. The reason why it's appropriate to have this hearing and to have close oversight of what's going on is we're going to see more trials coming down the pike, I hope, that also propose to, do, to take primary prevention as their goal but may involve risk to healthy people. If I'm right, and it's, it's not wrong to rule out that kind of study uh, simply uh, simpliciter in saying they're always wrong, then the two things we must look to, as history teaches us right from that Tuskegee study, are voluntary participation by informed subjects and the adequacy of study design. I think that the problem with the tamoxifen study quite simply is that there do appear to be difficulties with respect to the information that people are given uh, in the recruitment process to the study and with respect to the informed consent process of signing people up to actually participate in the study. There is some evidence that an accurate, incomplete, or in some situations incomprehensible information may have been or is now continuing to be provided to women who are recruited to participate in the study. And we heard about that in the earlier panel. Those who are sponsoring the study, the NCI, the study sites, must be aware that when the goal is prevention of disease in otherwise healthy people, only the highest standards of disclosure and accuracy will do. Informed consent is only possible in this study if the women being recruited not only are told, but understand that there are significant risks associated with tamoxifen, including cancer, thromboembolytic events, liver damage, eye damage, and a variety of uncomfortable and uh, perhaps incapacitating symptoms of the sort that we heard about in the previous panel. The study poses another and a different type of risk that I want to mention briefly, and that is that some experts fear that long-term exposure to tamoxifen may make the hormone less effective as a treatment should the subjects actually get breast cancer, and they need to understand that as well. You don't want to be in a situation where you find out that your willing participation, your free participation in a study has taken away from you the only opportunity to cure the disease that you were trying to prevent. So they need to understand that there may be some risk of that cruel occurrence taking place. And I'm not sure the current informed consent forms and recruitment information makes that comprehensible, makes that understood. My last point is that with respect to peer review, we have to uh, ensure that the study is designed so as to answer questions uh, that are of concern both to public health and to the public at large. And if uh, we are concerned about answering questions concerning breast cancer with regard to minority populations or certain age cohorts. If we're not recruiting enough people from these groups, then we can't get the answer to the question that we seek, and it would be wrong to impose risk on women uh, without being able to answer the question. So I would point to uh, uh, necessary improvements in informed consent and a closer look at the study design as the lessons that I take from uh, human experimentation that have to be learned in application to this study. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now hear from Dr. Fu Bergman. 
Good morning. I'm Adrienne Fu Berman. I'm a physician in Washington, and I'm the medical advisor to National Women's Health Network, the only national advocacy group that concentrates on only on women's health issues. The National Cancer Institute has allocated $60 million to the Breast Cancer Prevention Trial. Which will, this trial will give 8,000 healthy women a drug to see if it reduces the incidence of breast cancer. National Cancer Institute also believes that this drug will lower the risk of heart disease and osteoporosis. The National Women's Health Network opposes this trial on the grounds that there's little evidence to support the protective effects claimed, that women eligible for the trial are not truly high risk, and that tamoxifen is too toxic for use in healthy women. While a smaller trial of women at extremely high risk of breast cancer might be justified, a large trial of healthy women sets a dangerous precedent of disease substitution as, acceptable public, as an acceptable public health goal. Only about a third of women with breast cancer have known risk factors, so the trial protocol has generously expanded the high risk category to include all women over 60. The average 60-year-old woman's risk of developing breast cancer in her remaining lifetime is about 10%, and her risk of developing the disease within the five trial years is about 1.7%. Any woman over 35 is also eligible to enter the trial if her five-year risk is equal to that of a 60-year-old woman, the 1.7%. I might point out that this means there's a 98.3% chance that she's not going to develop breast cancer during the five trial years. The rationale for using tamoxifen in cancer prevention is that based on eight randomized controlled trials, there's a, um, about a one-third reduction in cancer of the second breast of tamoxifen treated women with breast cancer. However, both breasts of a woman with breast cancer belong to the same body. They've been exposed to the same genetic, environmental, and hormonal influences. There's no scientific basis for using the second breast of a woman with breast cancer as a healthy control. Published data show that tamoxifen only decreases the risk of breast cancer in the second breast in postmenopausal women. However, this trial is not limited to older women. An additional rationale for the trial is that tamoxifen reduces the incidence of breast cancer in rats, uh, breast cancer that's been induced by chemical carcinogens. However, there is some evidence that the tumors that do occur are more malignant. And there is a Swedish study which suggests that this may also be true in humans. The evidence for the alleged protective effects of tamoxifen is questionable. Five out of eight studies on osteoporosis found no benefit of tamoxifen on bone density. The three studies which showed a protective effect showed that effect only in the spine. Uh, spinal bone is composed mainly of spongy bone, and while spinal osteoporosis is, contributes to back pain, um, loss of height, dowager's hump, as it's sometimes called. This is not a major cause of mortality. Hip fracture, on the other hand, is a major cause of mortality. And there's no evidence that the compact bone, which predominates in the hip, is benefited by tamoxifen. Also, no study has shown a decrease in fracture rates among tamoxifen users. Evidence for cardiovascular benefit is also unimpressive. The majority of studies show that tamoxifen lowers total cholesterol, but the effect on HDL cholesterol, that's the good cholesterol, is variable. Now this is important because for men, their risk of cardiovascular disease rises linearly with total cholesterol levels over 200, and that's not true for women. They don't show this effect until their total cholesterol reaches 265. HDL cholesterol, however, is very important in women. Low HDL levels are a strong independent predictor of cardiovascular disease in women. So that if tamoxifen lowers total cholesterol while not affecting HDL levels, there's no reason to assume that that would cause a cardiovascular benefit. There's one out of the eight studies has shown a decrease in cardiac deaths. However, the significance of this finding is questionable because it's not clear that the control group and the tamoxifen group were initially equivalent in cardiovascular risk factors. If you had more smokers in one group or more people with high blood pressure in one group, that would affect the results. Risks of tamoxifen are well documented. It increases the risk of uterine cancer up to five-fold. Now, supporters of the trial will say, well, this is no worse than estrogen replacement therapy. This is a specious argument. Estrogen replacement therapy fell out of favor in the 1970s precisely because it increased endometrial cancer. And current hormonal regimens incorporate progestins with the estrogen in order to help negate this, this risk. 
Tamoxifen causes liver cancer in rats. There has not been a demonstrated increase in liver cancer among humans. However, liver cancers can take up to 20 years to develop, and there have been fewer than 5,000 women who've taken tamoxifen in clinical trials for more than five years. Also, the true incidence of liver cancer and tamoxifen users is unknown. If a woman with breast cancer develops a liver mass, it is often assumed to be a metastasis. If that mass is not biopsied or if autopsy data is not obtained later, you do not have proof that this, is, this liver mass is a metastasis as opposed to a second primary liver tumor. Liver failure and hepatitis have been reported both in the United States and England with tamoxifen. Tamoxifen also increases the risk of blood clots up to seven times. Now, blood clots can range from a trivial inflamed vein to a fatal pulmonary embolism. In the NSABP14 trial, two deaths did occur from thromboembolism in the tamoxifen group and none in the control group. Eye problems are known to occur with high-dose tamoxifen, but a recent study also revealed toxicity in exactly the same dose of uh, tamoxifen that's going to be used in this study group. Menopausal symptoms, especially hot flashes, are the most common side effect of tamoxifen treatment. Vaginal discharge or dryness, irregular menses, nausea, and depression have also been reported. These are considered medically insignificant, but they're important quality of life issues. It's been a dangerous trend within the medical profession to elevate risk factors to the status of diseases for which the inherent risks and side effects of medical treatment are thus acceptable. The medical profession has created a whole new category of patients who have nothing wrong with them but a statistical possibility. The alleviation of pain or pathology is worth some risk, but the toxicity of a treatment must be in reasonable proportion to the malignance of the disease which is being treated. Tamoxifen is a reasonable cancer treatment. It's relatively benign compared to other cancer therapies. When it's compared to preventive health measures such as vaccination, however, it fails the more stringent standard of safety that must be applied when a medical intervention is unleashed on a healthy population. Thank you very much. We now will hear from Dr. DiGregorio. Mr. Chairman, members, my name is Michael DiGregorio, and I'm a professor of medicine at the T University of Texas Health Science Center. My major research interests are clinical pharmacology with emphasis on drug resistance. Now, it's been several years now since the conception of the tamoxifen trial in healthy women deemed at high risk for developing breast cancer. Since then, new scientific evidence has become available that suggests that prolonged tamoxifen use may not be as safe as we once thought. In my recently published commentary that, that was uh, published in the Journal of National Institutes of Health and Research, which is not affiliated with the NIH, I questioned whether tamoxifen use in healthy women is worth the risk, of develop, worth the risk in attempting to prevent breast cancer. I reviewed these new research findings and the known toxicities of tamoxifen in regard to this trial. Today I'm going to focus my testimony on my major concerns and why I believe this clinical trial should be re-reviewed at this time. These include, but are not limited to, the potential for development of tamoxifen-resistant breast tumors in the women that are receiving tamoxifen in this trial. And my second major concern is the potential for tamoxifen to stimulate new hormone-independent aggressive breast tumors, particularly in the premenopausal women that are eligible for this study. Well, first, the potential for resistance in those women that developed tamoxifen during the five-year period of this study was never adequately addressed with known breast cancers have a clinical benefit in approximately 20 to 50 percent of those patients and that's dependent on the stage of their disease. Whereas the remaining women who have breast cancer never respond to tamoxifen. Now of the women that initially do respond to tamoxifen, virtually all of them will develop resistant tumors as evidenced by tumor reoccurrence. Therefore women in the tamoxifen arm of this study that develop breast tumors will have tamoxifen resistant disease and therefore will never benefit from tamoxifen therapy it would be in the case of 40 to 50 percent or 20 to 50 percent of the women who spontaneously develop breast cancer furthermore there is clinical evidence and disturbing evidence that not only supports this contention 
but also suggests that breast tumors that emerge during tamoxifen therapy may be, become dependent on tamoxifen for growth. For example, the mere discontinuation of tamoxifen therapy with no other therapy in some women, their tumors will become stabilized. That is, when they, are, when they become refractory to tamoxifen therapy, their tumors are growing rapidly. When tamoxifen is discontinued, sometimes just the stabilization of disease will occur. And in some patients, you will actually see the tumors shrink. Now this phenomena of tamoxifen potentially stimulating tumor growth is not just in humans. There are animal studies to support this. In research that we have done in other groups, that when you implant a tamoxifen resistant tumor in a mouse and you give tamoxifen by itself, tamoxifen will stimulate that tumor to grow faster than if you were to not treat that animal at all. Now, um, my second major point is that the premenopausal women that are eligible for this study may actually. Uh, tamoxifen may actually stimulate the production of new hormone independent aggressive breast tumors. Now in a recently published study from the Cancer Research Campaign, it's a European cooperative group and the senior author was Baum, they showed suggestive evidence that following two years of tamoxifen treatment in premenopausal women that were followed for 10 years that in this subset of patients that they had a higher incidence of contralateral breast tumors compared to the placebo group of their study. Now animal studies also support these findings. Several groups have shown that tamoxifen has the ability to induce aggressive hormone independent breast tumors in rats. These findings suggest in some cases that they may have the ability of activating dormant hormone independent breast cancer growth and therefore may be more dangerous uh, than to give a premenopausal patient tamoxifen than no treatment at all. Now in addition to these two concerns which are supported by animal studies and clinical observations, the toxicity profile, that is the women that will experience toxi the toxic effects that are deemed at high risk for developing breast cancer during this trial are of great concern. As stated by the NSAPP protocol, a certain portion of these women in tamoxifen treated group are going to develop life-threatening blood clotting disorders, secondary endometrial tumors which will require hysterectomies for treatment, visual toxicities, hormone related toxicities, and most disturbing about this study is the unknown long term safety data which may include the development of gastric and liver tumors. Finally, I'd like to conclude my testimony by stating that tamoxifen may induce breast tumors that are not only resistant to tamoxifen but are actually being stimulated to grow to by tamoxifen. This coupled with the potential for severe toxicities induced by tamoxifen, I think it would be fair and reasonable to re-review re at least the eligibility criteria and the safety issues surrounding this trial. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll now hear from our fourth panelist, Dr. Dr. Rodriguez Trias. Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of the subcommittee, I'm Dr. Helen Rodriguez Trias. I'm the president-elect of the American Public Health Association, a professional society founded in 1872, representing all disciplines and specialties of public health. With one in nine American women developing breast cancer in their lifetime, there is a dire need for new breast cancer prevention efforts. Some advances have been made in identifying those women genetically predisposed to breast cancer, but there has been little effort in finding preventive interventions. Promising leads in breast cancer prevention research may be deferred in favor of costly and possibly hazardous medical research on tamoxifen. Compared to other th chemotherapeutic agents, tamoxifen is considered relatively non-toxic. Nevertheless, considerable controversy has arisen over the use of tamoxifen to test for prevention of breast cancer in healthy women. There is concern that the definition of at risk also includes healthy women who may not actually be at elevated risk. There are several other concerns about the trial. 
Tamoxifen will be offered to premenopausal women and there are no data showing a reduction in tumors in that population. Some studies have shown an increase in the risk of endometrial in, or uterine cancers. There have also been studies on rats correlating elevated liver cancer risk with tamoxifen use. There are few data on the long-term effects of its use and many of the potential side effects indeed such as cancers may take many years to develop. APHA is concerned about this clinical trial for three reasons. First, have women been informed well enough about the risks associated with the study? This too is controversial. In order to ensure truly informed consent, it is essential that the risks and benefits be clearly spelled out and thoroughly understood by the person imparting the information as well as the person who will enter the study. With a tamoxifen study, the central weakness lies in a consent form that does not sufficiently emphasize the probable risks. Since the study is structured so that each of 270 centers collaborating may make up its own consent form, careful oversight of the 270 institutional review boards is especially important. For women, Long underrepresented in many studies on disease prevention and all too often the unwitting subjects of unproved therapies, there is often a fundamental issue of trust. This is particularly true of low-income women and women of color. If clinical trials are to be effective, any clinical trial, to be effective in recruiting a representative, diverse group of women, researchers must pay sensitive and close attention to ensuring an optimal informed consent process. Second, the study will use a potentially dangerous drug to test for preventive effects on otherwise healthy women. Most clinical trials involving therapeutic drugs apply treatments to individuals already known or suspected to have the disease. Trials involving healthy people usually deal with early detection of disease or intervention to reduce known risk of developing disease through changing behavior or conditions. An example of early detection is the studies of colon cancer. An example of prevention through behavior change is a community health education to encourage reduction of dietary fat intake in order to prevent colon cancer, or an intervention in the manufacturing of foods to decrease the amounts of fat and saturated fat available in pre-prepared foods. Third, APHA is sensitive to some of the peculiarities of well-publicized clinical trials involving highly feared diseases because of the recent difficulties we experience in studies of drugs on AIDS. Since tamoxifen is available on physicians' prescription, there is reason to fear that it might be requested by women who have the highest risk of breast cancer. This would remove those women in whom the greatest benefit might be shown from the trial and would render eventual interpretation of the study more difficult. We do not know to the extent to which protocol evasion is occurring with the tamoxifen trial, but th that is an issue. If tamoxifen did become the standard of care, the number of women involved would become enormous and create a significant safety and medical care access issue. Uh, this is particularly relevant because of the favorable publicity that tamoxifen has received. And just an illustrating anecdote, as I was working with staff on this um, document to present here today, my daughter called me uh, to ask me if I had information on tamoxifen. And when I asked her why, she says she has a 38-year-old friend whose mother was recently diagnosed with breast cancer and the physician has prescribed tamoxifen to the daughter. One of our experience with DES like tamoxifen, DES is a hormonal agent for use in women. It was used during the 1940s and 50s to treat between one half and five million women without adequate clinical trials to determine the risks. And as we know, it became the standard of care for women at risk of miscarriage, and yet 80% of the female offspring exposed to DES in utero had congenital abnormalities of vagina and cervix, and a small portion of women with this condition went on to develop vaginal cancer. In summary, 
APHA applauds recent federal efforts to close the research gaps that exist for many women's health issues, including breast cancer. Federally funded research into breast cancer prevention must be given top pri priority, and APHA urges research on public health preventive measures that do not require individual treatment. APHA is concerned about the inclusion of so many healthy women in the National Cancer Institute's tamoxifen trial. It raises special concerns of safety and human subject protection that should be addressed more specifically. In addition, the informed consent issue. Consistent with its established policy, APHA would recommend that participation in such studies be contingent upon full informed consent that includes an adequate discussion of risk. Finally, APHA is concerned that tamoxifen may become the standard of care before the trial is completed and all the risks and benefits have been adequately studied. Thank you very much. We'll uh, now hear from our final panelist, Dr. Piantadosi. Thank you, Mr. Payne. My name is Stephen Piantadosi. I'm presently an associate professor of oncology and director of biostatistics in the Oncology Center at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. I've been a member of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration's Oncologic Drugs Advisory Committee, ODAC, since 1989. In that capacity, I reviewed the National Surgical Adjuvant Breast and Bowel Project Protocol P1 titled A Clinical Trial to Determine the Worth of Tamoxifen for Preventing Breast Cancer and discussed it with the ODAC and staff of the FDA on two occasions, June 1990 and July 1991. My comments today result both from those experiences and from my understanding of facts that have become available since 1991. In the 1991 Advisory Committee review, I and other committee members expressed concern that the study population should be at sufficiently great risk of breast cancer so that the anticipated risk-benefit difference for tamoxifen would be large. The FDA asked us explicitly if the proposed study population seemed to be at sufficiently high risk, the absolute risk being roughly equivalent to that of a 60-year-old woman. Most committee members believed that this risk was too low, but were unable to say precisely how high it should be. Our general sentiment was that this aspect of the study design needed correction before proceeding, and that inclusion of low-risk women would present several problems for the study. However, we recognized the arbitrary nature of risk level as an eligibility criterion. In 1991, the advisory committee voted to recommend the general concepts in the study protocol, but to restrict it to women at higher risk for breast cancer. Subsequent versions of the protocol did not incorporate changes in response to our concerns. In keeping with an advisory role, the FDA did not inform advisory committee members of the exact conditions, if any, surrounding its subsequent official approval of the study protocol have a few comments regarding informed consent. Conveying accurate, appropriate, and understandable information to prospective clinical trial participants is a problem that is not unique to this study. Each participating institution regulates consent locally. I have studied only the Johns Hopkins consent document, which our institutional review board has approved. It appears reasonable. Because I have not studied the consent processes and documents of other institutions, I'm not aware of any inadequacies in the usual informed consent procedures for this study. I would want prospective participants to see details on the absolute risks of harm and benefit as a function of age or baseline risk level. They would then be free to assign their own weight to each of the possible outcomes and decide whether or not to participate. I commented similarly during the advisory committee review. Because these study participants do not have cancer, their motives for consenting may be more complicated than individuals who are already sick. For example, some women may find a 2% chance of developing breast cancer in the next five years to be an intolerably high risk, encouraging participation, while others may not. In closing, let me say that if we review the use of tamoxifen as a preventive agent, we really need to keep in mind several ideas. Most often, it is healthy populations that receive preventive agents. 
Many preventive agents carry risk, for example, vaccines, chlorine, medication, contraceptives. Furthermore, health cannot be defined passively as the absence of, of disease. In spite of not being ill, people at high risk of disease often appropriately accept higher risk preventives. This behavior is consistent with high risk being a state intermediate between health and disease. All preventives have in common a substantially lower risk than that associated with the disease. These ideas apply directly to the present study. Investigators are not suggesting administering tamoxifen casually or broadly, but rather as part of a carefully conceived and well-designed experiment. Neither do we have all the information desired about tamoxifen before we start, nor would we expect unanimity from experts on all aspects of the study plan. In 1991, I voted in favor of proceeding with the study after appropriate modifications. I continue to believe that with diligence in a study population of high-risk women, the tamoxifen prevention study would provide valid and useful information regarding prevention of breast cancer without knowingly compromising the well-being of the study participants. Thank you. Thank you, each and every one of you. Um, this time I'll ask my colleague uh, from New York who will have to leave the hearing uh, at this time, but I would ask him if he has any questions and any concluding remarks. Mr. Chairman, I have one, one basic question here. I know that in this format, all participants have to talk very rapidly, and you understand each other better than we understand you. Uh, however, do I understand correctly that Drs. Few Berman, De Gregorio, and Rodriguez Trias, you're all saying that you question uh, whether this, the testing of this drug should go forward under any conditions, under no conditions should it go forward. You're questioning the basic worthiness of the drug. Uh, do, is, is that what, what I hear? There's no agreement on a body of information that, uh, that is not disputed by a significant number of researchers, uh, is the implication that I, I, I get. It. Am I wrong? I'm not questioning the worth of the drug. It's a good cancer treatment. It's too toxic for use in a healthy population, and this study trial, the, the protocol includes a great many healthy women. If it were a smaller trial of extremely high-risk women, that might be a different story. But the National Women's Health Network does object to the trial as it, it's current, as it currently stands. Mm -hmm. Dr. Rodriguez-Trias, what did you mean by protocol evasion? <laughs> Um, women who choose to uh, be in the study but yet would do something else beyond what the study um, is designed to do. It's a placebo controlled study meaning that half the women will get tamoxifen and half will not but nobody will know which half and it may be possible that some of the women who end up being on placebo may end up going to some other physician and saying I want to be put on tamoxifen and that information not being there. That is in some way people subverting if you will the study design because of whatever publications there have been or, or information has been that makes them go in a certain direction or other. Mm -hmm. uh, Doctors Kaplan and Piantadosi, are you saying that up to now this drug has gone through the proper testing and proper preparation and it has met all of the standards that are usually applied before you go into human testing? <coughs> and, and that's generally accepted in the, among the uh, experts? I believe that the process through which the drug has gone up to this point is uh, a fairly standard one for development of, uh, of drugs, as I understand it. Uh, I do acknowledge that there are differences of opinion about uh, the population that the drug should be applied to, but I do not believe that there have been any uh, major deficiencies in the way the drug's been developed up to this point. I think the uh, tamoxifen trial has been subjected to close oversight and it should be because as I was trying to say in my testimony we are going into a healthy population with a drug with known risks for the first time with a goal of prevention. I think we should be more careful and it's not that we haven't been but I think we should be more careful and the area that I would cite is I don't believe that informed consent and recruitment of subjects has been adequately monitored so far in the trial. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, well, you wanted I wanted to comment on um, 
whether or not uh, this this is still safe or in the, in my view and I have to agree with Dr. Few Berman that I think now you know at the time of the conception of the study it was developed under the normal uh, route however there's a lot of new scientific information that needs to be reviewed and the protocol as it stands may not be as safe as we once thought so we need to go back and now incorporate those new studies and decide whether or not we should proceed at all or maybe select a, uh, a very high risk uh, population of healthy women to put that, on That is right. You did, I have a note here, you did say they have achieved opposite results and sometimes it stimulates other kinds of cancers. But kind of alarming statement there. It, it, it is, uh, but it's, it's true. It seems to be very... Um, uh, the, this drug typically works in postmenopausal uh, breast cancer. In premenopausal women that are eligible for this study, there is a, indeed a chance that it may actually produce more tumors in the tamoxifen treated group than in the placebo group. Thank you. Thank you very much. Once again, I really appreciate you taking the time out uh, of your busy schedule to participate in this hearing. Uh, Dr. Kaplan, the women participating in the tamoxifen study have a 1.7 chance of getting breast cancer during the five years of the study. What is your opinion of that risk compared to the risk of taking the drug? The difficulty with respect to uh, a small risk, a 1.7 percent chance, is that uh, different people are going to view it differently. As we know, there are some women who are uh, see themselves as at extreme enough risk to be involved in prophylactic mastectomy to avoid breast cancer. So when we're into the realm of taking drugs, uh, others may see this as more trivial. My opinion is that unless adequate, comprehensible information is continuously provided, not a one-shot dose up front, but continuously provided uh, in terms of recruitment and uh, continuation of subjects in the study, they can't weigh that risk against the, they can't weigh that danger against the kinds of risks that we've been talking about today. The uh, fact that the drug may lose some of its efficacy if they do turn out to be in that 1.7 percent of the population and the uh, known risks associated uh, with endometrial cancer, liver cancer, and so on. You can't process that risk, even though we may answer it differently, unless you make sure that that information is continuously updated and supplied to each study participant. Uh, what, what is your opinion, Dr. Kaplan, of a study that includes a small number of minority women or, say, women in a particular age group so that scientists cannot determine whether the drug is safe or effective for those participating women? That gets to the question of subject recruitment. Is it fair? Is it equitable? Uh, we have, since uh, uh, the days of the uh, horrors of the Tuskegee study, insisted that subject selection be looked at in terms of fairness and equity, minority women being allowed to come in, no discrimination against older or younger women. However, the issue of who to recruit is contingent, in my opinion, on what is the question that you want to ask. If you're looking solely for a preventative effect, uh, you might take the highest risk women and simply restrict it there and you won't be so concerned about specific age groups or perhaps specific minority groups. If on the other hand you want to know is there a risk that you can reduce in an age group or a minority population, the current study design may not give you that and we'd be doing something very unethical subjecting people to risk for a question we can't answer. Thank you. Um, Dr. Fu Berg Berman. Uh, you kind of answered it with Representative Owens' question, but uh, the National Women's Health Network has, expre has expressed its concern about this study in several public meetings, including the FDA advisory panel in July 1991. The network's concern have also been expressed by other experts. Why do you think, in your opinion, they have been ignored? Well, I think there's, there's a general sense of uh, despair or desperation in the cancer research community because we have not made great strides in breast cancer treatment. Uh, overall mortality has not, overall cure rate has not changed in 50 years. Mortality has dropped only slightly. We have made gains in early detection, uh, but it's not clear that early detection ultimately affects mortality. Uh, 
there's been a lot of pressure on National Cancer Institute from the National Women's Health Network, other groups, and the public health community about putting more money and attention towards prevention. This ill-conceived trial is not what we meant. Uh, risk factors are not the same thing as diseases, and to confuse the two is going to lead to a new era where it, it will be considered acceptable to have disease substitution rather than disease prevention. Thank you. Um, informed consent is more than a piece of paper. It's a process, as we know. And Dr. Fubergen, could you um, tell me um, what have women across the country told a network about the process as it currently stands? Their experience has been similar to that of, of Ms. Feinberg, um, that risks have not been adequately described in at least the first meetings that women have with, with researchers when they're being educated about the trial. The risks have been uh, n not discussed or minimized. Um, when women have brought up particularly questions of liver toxicity or liver cancer, that has been poo-pooed by the researchers. Um, I, I would say those are the, the two main things. Also that the benefits have been exaggerated in terms of heart disease and osteoporosis. Okay. Finally, uh, should the standards for a prevention study like this be different from those for a treatment study or modality? Oh, absolutely. You have to have a much higher margin of safety when you're dealing with a healthy population, that at least somebody who's sick is gambling on getting well when they're taking the risks of a drug or any medical intervention. When you're dealing with a healthy population, the risks should be equivalent to those of other public health measures, vaccination, fluoridation, vitamin D, um, enriched milk, or iodized salt. All right. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. D. Gregorio, um, although you too touched on it with Major Owens, uh, your testimony is very critical of the study. In your opinion, should the study be changed or stopped completely? Well, I see four possibilities. That you can continue the study as designed, which I think at this point is unacceptable. We could stop the study totally and dismantle the cooperative nature and the sites, and I don't think that's acceptable. We could revise the informed consent and include all these new scientific information and revise the eligibility and, in, and perhaps put women on that are very high uh, increased risk for development of breast cancer onto the study. And the fourth possibility is to continue to do the 16,000 patients and uh, just make one revision and that is don't give them tamoxifen. I think that there's enough evidence now that shows that if you detect breast cancer early on and when the careful monitoring of this study that the placebo group within the study may actually have a survival benefit because breast cancer can be curable with localized therapies if detected early and therefore this trial may be very beneficial in the placebo group that are being monitored just as closely as the ones that are receiving tamoxifen. So those are my four possibilities. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me ask you this too. Some physicians argue that women who are afraid of breast cancer will want tomography treatment whether or not there is a study. So does that therefore justify, is this a good reason to continue to study? Well, I don't think that justifies uh, using tamoxifen. Uh, in regards to prevent, trying to prevent breast cancer. And I have a message to the uh, community physicians who are not participating in this study and who are dispensing tamoxifen to their patients. They're putting their patients at risk for all these problems we discussed today. And I hope that they have their malpractice insurance increase because there could be a potential that they will actually uh, get some uh, negative benefits themselves. So we need to, to inform physicians out there not to dispense this drug uh, on a casual basis. It is not a safe drug to be administering to uh, what they have deemed as high-risk patients. Thank you. Dr. Kaplan, would you like to respond to that question also? Well, it seems to me that the uh, uh, options that are out there uh, point us towards saying that we cannot continue unless the informed consent uh, 
for both for recruitment and continuation in the study is updated in light of the latest findings. I think we must insist that the uh, National Cancer study sites come to some form of uniform protocol with respect to information given, how it's given. We haven't heard much today, and I hope we do later, about what can be done to test comprehension and understanding of study participants. It's one thing to give the information, it's another thing to make sure that somebody's monitoring it. And lastly, it seems to me the study design has to be looked at closely to see whether the risk-benefit equation in terms of getting a finding still favors continuation. I don't say uh, personally myself it doesn't, but I think that's where the uh, moral nub of the matter lies. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Rodriguez Trias, so far only 4% of the women in the study are minorities. In your testimony you mentioned that some minority women do not trust the government and government studies. What kind of efforts are needed, in your opinion, to overcome that mistrust? I think the efforts that are, that are needed have to do um, with overcoming some of the past history and unfortunately some of the present history in how the health care system has related to the women. Uh, you must absolutely have involvement of the women who are going to be participants in any study in terms of determining the informed consent process. We found that that was a very key element in assuring that the process was going to be relevant and effective. And the participation of the women who are going to be affected, that is people representing these women, individuals representing these women, is also essential in terms of gaining the trust of the rest of the community. That is of communicating this is okay, you know, as a study or it's not. I'm uh, speaking in general terms, not specifically of uh, tamoxifen. I think tamoxifen has uh, particular drawbacks, as, and I have to agree with uh, Dr. Kaplan on his statements about what the informed consent process must contain in terms of up-to-date information. But if I may say so, another element that is needed to gain that trust is education and re-education and monitoring of the behavior of the health providers and the researchers because it is quite possible to in the informed consent process totally bias the information by uh, being somewhat authoritarian by withholding by even body language you know as to what you think the questions someone may ask you are pertinent or not so I it, it's 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 essential that there be a really honest to goodness effort to educate all the participants in the research study in terms of what appropriate informed consent process is. Thank you. Um, uh, even uh, if minority women uh, trusted the government studies, uh, Dr. Rodriguez Trias, uh, would the failure of the government to pay for all medical tests needed to participate? make it unlikely for minority women, especially poor women, to participate in substantial numbers? I would say yes, that, that this is an extremely crucial issue. When we look at the hopes of detecting early on uh, the presence of breast cancer, and we know that the probabilities of an African-American woman having a mammography during the early stages of having early diagnosis are perhaps one-third to one-fourth of the probability of a non-African-American woman or Caucasian woman, I think we realize that we are failing in a very um, clear way in terms of where people interface with the system that is making care accessible to them and indeed it has to be provided if we hope in any way to have representation. Thank you and finally um, uh, NCI has a seven year 135 million dollar study aimed at preventing lung cancer by helping people to give up smoking and as you mentioned education and teaching children not to smoke. It's called the ASSIST program. Unfortunately, the funding for that study has been cut. What is the position of the American Public Health Association regarding programs like the ASSIST program that deals more with prevention? And 
So. That they are essential and that ultimately they are the ones that are going to provide the answers that will apply to large numbers of population and that will be cost effective. If I may uh, add though, um, there are also other measures that are not just aimed at changing individual behavior but have to do with a larger community environmental. As an example in smoking is the prohibition of smoking in places where people may be subjected to the passive uh, inhalation of the smoke. Uh, that's one. The taxation on uh, excise taxes, raising excise taxes on the tobacco products, which will discourage, particularly among the young, will discourage the purchase and the beginning of the addiction to such uh, products. It, it, the advertising, uh, the working on on uh, campaigns to um, it, in, in somehow alter media and the media promotion of it through the sitcoms or whatever is done making smoking very glamorous and etc. So that there are a number of other measures that are public health measures that don't depend just on individual education and individual behavior. Thank you. There is a proposal in New Jersey to tax those cigarettes and alcohol and other other sin taxes they're called to offset the change in the uncompensated care process that uh, the state of New Jersey uh, was doing up to the present time that it was called uh, unconstitutional by, by the courts. And so that is certainly something that's being considered. Uh, Dr. Pianto Dosi, would you please tell me, in your opinion, in this study, there will be 8,000 women who will get tamoxifen and 8,000 who will be treated with a placebo. Currently, less than 1% of the women in the study are African Americans. Would 1% of 16,000 women, or even 10% of 16,000 women, be a large enough group to draw a conclusion about the safety or effectiveness of tamoxifen for African American women? The answer to that question depends upon some biologic knowledge that we don't yet have. If, if you wish to detect a, a different treatment effect due to tamoxifen in subsets of the study population, then one, statistically speaking, would not be able to do that in very small subsets. So, for example, if it became important to determine whether tamoxifen had a different effect in Caucasian women than in black women, that kind of a sample would be inadequate. On the other hand, if one believes or knows on a biological basis that the effect of tamoxifen does not depend upon race, then I believe that the findings of a trial with this general design would generalize to other segments of the population. We don't have enough information to answer the question. Okay, if 40% of the women in the study are premenopausal, Will that be a large enough group of women to determine whether tamoxifen is safe or effective for premenopausal women? Uh, if such a large fraction of women are premenopausal, I think that one could get uh, fairly reasonable estimates about uh, safety in premenopausal women. The question about efficacy uh, is subject to the same restrictions I mentioned just a moment ago. That is, the entire study population may not be large enough to detect differences in efficacy by menopausal status. Uh, I think the question here is even murkier because there are biological grounds to believe that the effect of tamoxifen might be different in pre- and post-menopausal women. Uh, therefore, if, we were, uh, if it were necessary to design the trial to detect that difference, I think uh, a larger sample size of both pre- and post-menopausal women would probably be required. If all of the 16,000 women were post-menopausal, would it be easier to determine if tamoxifen prevents heart attacks, osteoporosis, and is safe and effective for treatment of breast cancer? I think the answer to that is definitely yes. In general, you'd want to conduct a test of the drug in the population or subpopulation that's at highest risk of those occurrences. And since everything you mentioned is generally positively associated with increasing age, I think that the question would be uh, easier and more precisely answered in postmenopausal women. Hey, if all of the women in the study were at 
higher risk for breast cancer? Would it be easier to determine if tamoxifen is effective? I think in general it would, yes, and I, I addressed this uh, concern in my written testimony. Uh, again, the answer is very similar to the one I just gave. Uh, if, the, if the efficacy of tamoxifen is defined as reducing the occurrence of new breast cancers, then the population at highest risk of getting new breast cancers would be the place that the trial is going to have, uh, have its most yield. So I would answer yes to that as well. Okay, uh, finally, um, I want to make sure I understand your testimony. Uh, last year, the FDA advisory panel recommend that the study be restricted to women at higher risk of breast cancer. However, the study now underway includes women at a lower level of risk than what the panel recommended. Is that true? That, that's correct. The panel uh, reviewed the risk levels proposed in the protocol and they were then substantially as they are today and we were not able to say exactly how high those risk levels should be, but in general we were uncomfortable with them being uh, at the point they are currently. Thank you. Let me just conclude by asking each of the panels this hypothetical question. Uh, that, say if you're your mother or your sister or another eligible to participate in this study, would you recommend that they do so? No. They should eat a low-fat, high-fiber diet, take selenium and antioxidants, and exercise. I agree with the exception of my ex-wife. <laughs> I'm just kidding, but... <laughs> My feeling is that if my wife or female family member had a sufficiently high risk that I would encourage them to participate in this study. <laughs> I'm not in the habit of telling my mother or my sister what to do, um, but I would hope that if they had adequate information based upon what I know, my hunch is that certainly not, I wouldn't recommend uh, for my sister, I might for my mother if she had the uh, complex of risk factors that might give a reasonable risk benefit yield, but I'd hope she'd have the information to make the call. I guess I'll be personal because my mother died of breast cancer and I'm over 60 years of age, so I suppose I fall into relatively high risk a category. I would not go on the tamoxifen trial, personally. I think we, we still have a uh, great deal more to learn about the toxic effects before uh, we can say. Now, if it were someone at an extremely high risk, you know, the, the first, uh, they say first degree relatives on various side, maybe, perhaps. Well, let me uh, thank all of you once again for taking time out of your busy schedules. Your testimony has certainly been very enlightening and helpful. Thank you. At this time, we'll call up our third and final panel to includes Dr. Bernadine Haley, Director of the National Institutes of Health, Dr. Peter Greenwall, Associate Director for Prevention and Director, Division of Cancer Prevention and Control of the National Center, National Cancer Institute, and Dr. Carl Peck, Director of the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research at the Food and Drug Administration. Of course, they will all be accompanied by um, a number of their colleagues and after they take their seat, they certainly um, would be um, asked if they would introduce uh, their colleagues to us.
As I explained earlier, it is our custom to swear in all the witnesses. Please have all of those who will be testifying. Please stand and uh, raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you. Let the record indicate that all the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Let me uh, once again uh, Thank you for joining us today uh, with a special thanks to uh, Dr. Healy for rearranging her very busy schedule so that she could be here. We certainly appreciate that and we will ask Dr. Healy, Dr. Greenwall and Dr. Peck to try to limit your testimony to, five minute, to a five minute summary so that we will have enough time for questions. Of course your written statement will be entered into the record in its entirety. Uh, would you uh, like to introduce each of you to introduce your colleagues? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm accompanied, of course, by Dr. Greenwald from the National Cancer Institute, Dr. Ford, Dr. Nayfield, and Dr. Pugilisi, uh, who is from the Office for Protection from Research Risks at the NIH. We also are accompanied by uh, Dr. Carl Peck from the uh, FDA, who is also accompanied by his colleagues, Dr. Burke and Dr. Justice. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll proceed with you, Dr. Healy. Thank you. As you well know, Mr. Chairman, breast cancer is a disease of immense proportion and great cruelty. Some have described it as an epidemic. Breast cancer has become for women the leading cancer risk, and unfortunately that risk only increases with age. Not one of us here could say that we have not been touched directly or indirectly by this disease, our mothers, our sisters, our best friends or acquaintances, perhaps even ourselves. Just recently in the Washington Post, there was a series about a Silver Spring, Maryland pastor who spoke from her pulpit to tell her congregation that she, who has counseled and consoled so many, has now come to ask for counsel and comfort as she herself confronts breast cancer. We recognize this story and others like it and are compelled by it. It's for these reasons, it is for these women, it is for all women and for scientific opportunities to address this killer of women that we conduct research on breast cancer both treatment and prevention. For the, for the 1.4 million women estimated to be living with breast cancer in 1992, we must pursue new treatments. But we also must hearken to the concerns of those at risk, those with family histories of breast cancer, with personal risk in their own history, and those who will face higher risk as they get older. And indeed, we have a great tradition, Mr. Chairman, of worrying about those at risk. The nature of vaccination, prophylactic penicillin for rheumatic fever, indeed, uh, pharmacologic therapy for high cholesterol levels are all about trying to prevent disease in people who face high risk. But breast cancer is today part of an epidemic of a special group of tumors that are, for the most part, hormone sensitive. This group includes, by the way, prostate cancer as well, and other epidemic. Therefore, hormonal interventions are likely to influence the course of these diseases. Consequently, we have undertaken trials such as the breast cancer prevention trial on the drug tamoxifen. There are things we don't know about tamoxifen. That's the reason for the trial, and many of the concerns raised by the earlier panel indeed are one of the reasons why we must do this trial. But there are things we do know. We know, for example, that for women who have had breast cancer and who have been treated with tamoxifen, there is a 30 to 40 percent reduced rate of breast cancer in the opposite breast. There is also, and I must correct the previous panel, there is no evidence from the existing control studies that women who uh, have a higher rate of breast cancer if they are on tamoxifen, and there is no evidence that if they get breast cancer on tamoxifen that they do any worse than the control group. 
These facts are ones that we cannot ignore. It is a fact that women and their doctors do not ignore. For NIH, the pressure of scientific evidence is clear. There is evidence that women at risk could benefit from this treatment. We do not believe that we can refuse to do it. Moreover, tamoxifen is already being prescribed off-label, as are other non-proven interventions like prophylactic mastectomy in young women. Our experience with lack of adequate information on hormonal therapy, which we're now attempting to unravel through the Women's Health Initiative, has underscored the necessity of learning early what is safe and effective before a drug or a hormone or a device, such as breast implants, are placed in general use without complete evaluation. At the NIH, we believe strongly and are very proud that our advisory and peer review systems, which are the most developed in all of government and indeed across the world, have served all of NIH and the public extremely well. The tamoxifen study has been in development using this elaborate process since 1984. It has received review and numerous endorsements by outside experts on three scientific advisory boards. The National Cancer's National Advisory Council, consisting of scientists and laypersons, made final recommendations on this proposal, which has substantially changed due to the commentary and input of the community. In addition, distinguished and dedicated NIH scientists and program officials, many of whom are with me today, who are intimately involved with the current research and scientific development in certain areas, uh, provide continuous oversight of this trial. In all of our review processes, I must add, special additional consideration is given to the use of human subjects. Independent reviewers are expected to function as advocates of the patients in any proposed clinical trial involving human subjects. Reviewers take into consideration the recommendations of individual IRBs, or institutional review boards, that are patient advocates looking independently at the uh, role of the patient in a particular uh, clinical trial. The IRBs, first and foremost, must ensure that risk to subjects are reasonable in relationship to anticipated benefit and the importance of the knowledge that may reasonably be expected to result. My, con my colleagues here and I at the NIH are confident that the current view system is second to none in both rigor and scope. We believe it effectively minimizes unnecessary duplication of activities, but most importantly minimizes and clearly defines the risk to human subjects that would be involved. Clinical trials of experimental therapies, of vaccines, of devices, are vital for NIH to fulfill its mission to the American public. These trials enable us to rigorously explore unanswered questions, questions of the type that were raised here today, questions about the best way to deliver patient care. If we all knew the answers, Mr. Chairman, such clinical trials would not be necessary. But we would be practicing forever yesterday's medicine. Individuals who choose to participate in clinical trials have a right to know what we know and what we do not know. And I strongly endorse some of the comments I heard today that patients must be informed as in every way and every uh, question answered. That is the purpose, and that is the spirit of informed consent, and we recognize that obligation. Many choose to participate despite uncertainties. Many say no. There are probably those who would not want any trial unless there are zero risks. We do not enter into trials lightly, Mr. Chairman. We do not conduct trials without believing, based on scientific evidence, that those most in need of the answers will reap more benefits than undergo risks this is a basic tenet of medicine and an underlying sacred principle that governs any physician-patient relationship. The most effective treatment for breast cancer is still the prevention of breast cancer. Prevention of disease is at the heart of all of our basic and clinical research at NIH. The Congress also has repeatedly and strongly mandated that prevention research should be among NIH's highest priorities. Indeed, it was last December that your distinguished predecessor, Mr. Weiss, who was himself a fervent advocate of medical research, who focused on NIH's role in breast cancer and encouraged us to do more in the area of prevention. Over the ensuing months since that hearing, we've expanded our prevention research efforts. As physicians and scientists, we know well that prevention provides hope 
especially for those at risk for diseases for which there are no easy or ready cures. That's why the tamoxifen trial is so important. In conclusion, I believe this trial on tamoxifen is well grounded in science and in our mission to advance human health through science. The study is well designed and it is tightly and ongoingly monitored and it will offer benefits for many of us here today as well as for individuals at risk for breast cancer in the future. It will offer choices to women who have a history of being deprived of choices and it will offer women the option to say no. The trial has wide-based support and I'm a little disappointed that some of the supporters weren't here today from the external community. Accordingly, I would like to introduce to the record a statement just handed to me by the National Coalition for Cancer Research, which expresses concerns about some sensationalist statements that are clearly, in their words, a disservice to women of this country, if I might do so, Mr. Chairman. Without objection. We understand the concerns that have been raised and we encourage this kind of public dialogue that you're having today and participation with the NIH on this and other trials that we support. Tamoxifen clearly holds great promise as a preventive strategy for women facing breast cancer, but it's part of a broader thrust by the NIH to better understand and treat this terrible epidemic facing all American women. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Peck, oh, excuse me, Dr. Greenwall. Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to appear before you to discuss the National Cancer Institute's important clinical trial in breast cancer prevention. I'd like to add that we have with us Dr. Dan Eide, the Deputy Director of NCI, and Dr. Bill Harlan, the new Associate Director for Prevention at NIH. I also have a longer statement that I'd appreciate being put in the record. Without and, objection. And one more thing, in, in listening this morning, I think it would be useful if you could insert in the record the model informed consent form. We believe it is fully up to date, but we certainly are willing to consider new information and adjust as new information becomes available. It'll be included without objection. Thank you. Let me start by making several points from a policy perspective. Prevention often is the most important key to reducing the impact of any disease. That is why we at NIH are so delighted that Dr. Bernadine Healy has confirmed her commitment to prevention research and selected Dr. Harlan to promote disease prevention research at the agency. When feasible, clinical trials provide the gold standard of evidence for prevention research. There is no better way to be sure which research projects lead to broad public benefit. We need a broad base of research to test the opportunities for preventing many diseases, including preventing breast cancer. That is why NIH is sponsoring the Women's Health Initiative which tests the benefits of a low-fat eating pattern and other factors against breast cancer and other diseases. That is why NCI and the Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute are sponsoring a cancer prevention study in 40,000 women using beta-carotene, vitamin E, and aspirin. That is why NCI has an aggressive chemo prevention research program which will bring several more food constituents or pharmaceutical agents into clinical trials for breast cancer prevention within the next two or three years. I also would like to note that Congress has been quite specific about the need to conduct further research in breast cancer prevention precisely on tamoxifen. In fiscal year 1992, a House and Senate conference report stated, conferees urge that an increase be provided above the President's request for NCI to be used to establish a program for a major study of the use of tamoxifen as, as a prevention of breast cancer. This is a matter of great importance to members of Congress, the administration, 
and the American people. What is the NCI tamoxifen breast cancer prevention trial? It is one of three such trials underway worldwide. <clears throat> In this presentation, I will refer to data from a British trial begun over six years ago, which has accrued 1,700 women, one half on tamoxifen, and who have a family history of breast cancer. Another trial recently was begun in Italy. All three prevention trials are based in part on five trials of tamoxifen for localized breast cancer, which in the aggregate show a 40% reduction of new cancers in the opposite breast. And we brought a chart. I don't know if we can bring it up. <clears throat> this is the only instance I know where cancer prevention was demonstrated in people this clearly before a prevention trial was begun. Kara, could you twist it so that mm. mem members of Congress can see it? Yeah, let them see it. Thanks. Thanks very much. Okay. That's fine. This chart shows can you say yeah. this chart shows the result of the US trial. And as you can see, in the US trial, there was a fifty percent drop in new cancers of the other breast. That is, we have major evidence that prevention already is occurring in the opposite breast in these therapy trials. It is a fantastic lead that cannot be ignored and makes many of us across the country who work in cancer research think that this may be one of the most important trials ever to be done. Tamoxifen has been used to treat breast cancer patients for over 30 years. It is estimated that four and a half million women have taken this drug. And we have 41,000 women years of information on how women tolerate tamoxifen during carefully controlled breast cancer therapy trials. As all patients enrolled in NCI clinical trials are followed for their lifetime, we also have substantial long-term follow-up data on tamoxifen effects. The breast cancer prevention trial is being conducted in 270 centers across the United States and Canada. It is led by Drs. Bernard Fisher, Carolyn Redmond, and their colleagues in Pittsburgh who run what many of us believe is the best breast cancer clinical trials group in the world. They have vast experience. They also ran the placebo-controlled trial called B14, which is in part the basis for the prevention trial. The trial will involve 16,000 women, of whom 8,000 will receive tamoxifen and the other 8,000 a placebo. Two groups of women are eligible to be considered for participation based on their risk of developing breast cancer. Because risk increases with age, being over 60 means a woman at high risk for developing breast, is at high risk for developing breast cancer. On an average, women over 60 have a 10% risk of developing breast cancer in their lifetime. That is 500 women out of 100,000 per year, a rate that we at NIH feel is unacceptable. Therefore, all women over age 60 are eligible to be in this trial. In fact, we are finding in the early accrual that most of the women entering are above the average risk for 60-year-old women. Women between the ages of 35 and 59 are also eligible if they have a five-year risk of developing this disease equivalent to that of a 60-year-old. The risk is determined on the basis of factors such as family history of breast cancer, age at menarche and first full-term pregnancy, and the number of biopsies and whether they show breast lesions or atypical cells and growth patterns. Now, let us consider the important safety issues. 
No intervention is totally without risks. And tamoxifen does have some potential side effects. The likely benefits and the reasons for the trial are a reduction in breast cancer and heart disease and maintenance of bone density. It is important to keep in mind the dimensions of these potential benefits. The possible adverse effects that I will mention are blood clots, endometrial and liver cancers, and an unsubstantiated report of eye problems and hot flutches. My comments largely are based on data from the several large adjuvant therapy trials, including B14, the ongoing British study of healthy women, and other reports in the literature. These trial results are the best data that we have. On blood clots, the large B14 trial, which uses 20 milligrams of, blood, of tamoxifen, has shown blood clots to develop in 1.3% of 1,400 women and 0.2% of those on placebo, including two deaths. Would, would you be able to conclude? Um, yes, well, I have itself. other things that you can enter that I believe give the best facts we have All right. on the risk side. I want to mention the eye toxicity study that these, uh, we reviewed this with experts at the Eye Institute. They felt they were changes compatible with aging. There was a lack of photographs or documentation. We are doing further work to confirm or refute this, but we're not. Con we're not uh, concerned about the data. All right, we will and, um, be okay. asking you questions about that. So if you could uh, conclude, and then we'll hear from Dr. Peck, and then we'll go into the question. I shall. Uh, in conclusion, many women like the choice we are offering and are voting with their feet in support of this trial. Today, four and one half months after opening the trial, about 30,000 women have had initial risk assessments. Approximately 20,000 have been found eligible based on risk to continue in the enrollment process and are awaiting final medical exams. And about 3,300 have entered into the trial and are receiving tamoxifen or placebo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. We really appreciate that. And your um, testimony, as we indicated, will uh, be included in the record its in entirety. Uh, Dr. Peck. Mr. Chairman, I am also pleased to be here and to have the opportunity to discuss the review by the FDA of the, a protocol for a clinical trial of tamoxifen to prevent breast cancer. I'm accompanied by uh, two of our very best staff, uh, two cancer specialists who, who themselves have treated patients with cancer, Dr. Greg Burke, who heads our uh, division of uh, oncologic drug products, and um, Dr. Bob Justice, a medical officer uh, who is our uh, greatest expert on tamoxifen. I can add little to the discussion we've just heard about breast cancer and the risk of this tragic disease for uh, American women. I only want to emphasize the points made by Dr. Healy and Dr. Greenwald. Uh, many women in this country face an unacceptably high risk of breast cancer. These women, for some of us, are our sisters, our mothers, or our daughters. As scientists and researchers and regulators, we bear an awesome responsibility to work to reduce that risk. Prevention is clearly the best way to do that, and the best approach to establishing new cancer treatments is through scientifically sound controlled clinical trials. At least eight years ago, an FDA advisory committee uh, told us that it was time to consider a protocol to test an appropriate pharmacologic intervention to prevent breast cancer. Uh, therefore, when we received the first such protocol a couple of years ago, we were eager uh, and prepared to review it. Like the NIH, FDA is enthusiastic uh, about facilitating a well-controlled, ethical, scrupulously conducted clinical study of a promising drug to prevent breast cancer. We believe that tamoxifen is such a candidate drug and that recently, the recently initiated breast cancer prevention trial, which was approved by FDA, is well designed and well suited to answer questions about the safety and effectiveness of the drug as a preventive agent. I think researchers would generally agree that a drug already uh, that, that if a drug has already been show, shown to be safe and effective as a therapeutic, we have a head start in testing its potential for prevention. 
This is because we already know a great deal about the drug, having had hundreds of thousands of uh, patients and patient years of experience. Uh, as uh, was just pointed out, a number of studies have documented the benefit uh, from tamoxifen in reducing tumor recurrence. And importantly, uh, the observation that many patients have uh, experience a significant reduction uh, in uh, the development of contralateral breast cancer uh, relative to patients uh, who were treated with a placebo. All of these factors were important backdrops to FDA's review of the protocol. I'd like to briefly summarize two of the many important questions that were critical to FDA in our review of the NSABP protocol. One question we, we must always ask is, does the sponsor have the ability to competently undertake and to complete the study, particularly one of this magnitude and this duration of time? Uh, this question is very critical, Mr. Chairman, uh, because if the study cannot be completed properly, then individuals uh, who have participated in it will have done so meaninglessly. Um, this is a five-year study, uh, which could go on to a longer one, and which provides for lifetime follow-up of all women who enroll in the trial. Uh, we are persuaded that uh, the NSABP is an internationally recognized cancer research organization with a well-established track record for all of these areas. Second, is the proposed patient population appropriate? In testing a drug as a preventive ag agent, we recognize that we will be administering the drug to many healthy individuals. It is FDA's before we approve such a protocol, the trial participants are in fact at risk of the disease so that they will have a potential definable benefit uh, to gain. This benefit must be greater than the risk posed to them from, uh, from the drug. Um, and as, a as part of this ass assessment, we must uh, also be sure that study participants are being properly informed about the risks. We believe these criteria are satisfied in this protocol. Um, and I'll dispense with discussing the risk because I think that's been adequately uh, discussed, the risk of, of, of uh, breast tumors and the uh, uh, balance with uh, regards to safety. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to spend briefly uh, a moment explaining exactly what FDA's role was in approving this protocol. As you know, we are required under the law to approve the use of any experimental drug in human patients. Although tamoxifen is widely used as a th approved for the treatment of breast cancer, it is not approved as a preventive. Although, as you've heard already this morning, some physicians may already be subjecting their patients to the unknown risks and unknown benefits of this drug for this purpose. Therefore, for this use, tamoxifen was treated like any other new unapproved drug and received a full review for the protocol. We received the first draft for this protocol in September 1991 and approved it about a year later. During that time, the protocol was reviewed by our Oncologic Drugs Advisory Committee, a uh, collection of uh, internationally acclaimed experts in cancer therapy. We worked closely with the study sponsors and our advisors to make certain that changes were made in the protocol, such that the final study would reflect all of our concerns and our advisors about safety and potential benefits, as well as about informed consent. As I mentioned earlier, our advisory committee had considered the concept of a prevention trial for uh, a number of years, so there was a great deal of background and knowledge uh, that uh, was brought to the table. One of the, part, one of the committee's reservations about the protocol was the level of risk of participants. The resolution of this matter required a great deal of discussion and negotiation. Uh, my staff has told me that this particular protocol is probably the most evaluated protocol that, that, uh, that we have uh, perhaps ever seen at the FDA. And it, certainly if you look at it, it's a model for uh, quality clinical trial design. The committee could not define a particular level of risk that they believe could be required, even though at times uh, members thought that the risk should be uh, higher. On the other side, the investigators were concerned about the need to accrue a sufficient number of patients to reach statistically significant conclusions. The final agreement was that the risks and benefits of the drug would be to the table. One of the, part, one of the committee's reservations about the protocol was the level of risk of participants. The resolution of this matter required a great deal of discussion and negotiation. 
Uh, my staff has told me that this particular protocol is probably the most evaluated protocol that, that, uh, that we have uh, perhaps ever seen at the FDA. And it, certainly if you look at it, it's a model for uh, quality clinical trial design. The committee could not define a particular level of risk that they believe could be required, even though at times uh, members thought that the risk should be uh, higher. On the other side, the investigators were concerned about the need to accrue a sufficient number of patients to reach statistically significant conclusions. The final agreement was that the risks and benefits of the drug would be quantitated fully and in lay terms so the potential participants in the study could clearly understand them and make a decision, an informed decision for themselves. This conclusion met with the approval of the majority of our advisory committee members. We are satisfied that the trial will be offered to a wide range of women and that these women will be able to choose to enter the trial with a good understanding of the potential risks and benefits of taking this drug. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, let me again emphasize that several witnesses, what several witnesses have already stated, breast cancer is a major uh, medical and public health problem. The fear of this disease in women is enormous. The risk of this disease is great. As scientists, we must recognize that preventing breast cancer is the single best way to solve the problem. The clinical study offers, this clinical study offers women who are at risk a measure of hope and a measure of potential choice. Tamoxifen is not risk-free. There is no such thing. But risk associated with this drug must be compared with its potential benefits for women at risk of breast cancer. FDA and its advisory committee have concluded that the merits of the study outweigh the a document obtained by the BBC says the measures would deny refugee status. The participants are protected, that new information is considered, and the, the study comes to, comes to a scientifically sound conclusion. Thank you. My colleagues and I would be pleased to respond to your questions. Thank you very much, um, each of you, for your very uh, complete <coughs> testimony. I will uh, just begin the questioning, and of course, anyone on the uh, panel might feel free to uh, answer. Uh, NCI received two applications for this multi-million dollar grant. Why did you fund the application that had a worse priority score, which was submitted by Dr. Fisher from the University of Pittsburgh? Uh, sir, there were two applications that had what we would consider to be equivalent scores. Uh, in the peer review system, they were within about 15 points of each other. One uh, cost nearly a hundred million dollars more than the other one, and it was not too difficult a decision. Uh, the, uh, I realize that Dr. Fisher's study was less expensive, uh, but that may be causing problems in attracting uninsured women to participate in the study. For example, 69% of the consent forms explain that women or their insurance companies will have to pay for it, the many medical tests that are not provided for free. One center at UCLA says, if I cannot pay for these tests with my own resources or insurance, I should not join the study. Therefore, how can this study attract poor women if women have to pay hundreds of dollars for medical tests as a requirement for participating in the study? First, let, let me answer that by saying we consider the tests that are uh, required in this protocol to be part of good medical care for women that are at increased risk of developing breast cancer. Those tests and procedures that are outside the or experimental, such as bone density studies and EKGs for certain women, are the costs for those are being provided. Uh, our model consent form contains language uh, saying that the center will defray the cost for women that can't afford it. However, this is a local IRB decision about how they conduct research in their institutions. We're very concerned about the issue of women coming into this study who can't afford the basic good medical care that is warranted for their level of risk. In the context of the study, we've set aside some money that will be used to pay for women who are un under or uninsured. In addition, each of the centers has been required to come up with plans for how they will include minority and underserved women in their population and how they will uh, go about covering some of the costs involved. And we have heard incredible stories, starting with the University of Pittsburgh, 
that was able to go to an outside lab for blood work and reduce their costs from about $250 for the panel of lab tests to $8 per participant. Uh, many physicians are providing their services free of charge for the required physical exams, and uh, many of the centers have negotiated rates for mammographies far below that that uh, they charge on the open market. According to um, studies, though, uh, we've seen that only 4% of the participants are minority women, and uh, in mid-September, less than 1% of the women in the study were African Americans. Uh, is this still true? That, that is certainly a concern of ours. Uh, we have a commitment to enroll minority women to the extent that they would be represented in the eligible pool of women to go on this study. That's our goal. Uh, as in many studies like this, the, the, remember the study's only been open for four months, uh, the initial women are self-referred. Many of these have been patients of uh, sisters and mothers of patients of these physicians. Most of the women have a family history of breast cancer. In review of our clinical centers across the country, we specifically targeted them to tell us their plans for recruiting minority and underserved women. We had a meeting in September where we stressed the need to improve the accrual of uh, minority women to this trial. We have plans to uh, continue a subcommittee that we've met, has met in the past, but at that time without data, to specifically target strategies for attracting minority and underserved women into the trial. We have centers, including our minority-based CCOP and ma many of the major black medical schools in the country that are participants. But uh, it, it is a problem in most clinical trials, but we are committed to address it. Let me just add that we would keep the protocol open until we get a good balance. Hey, I um, hope, as you indicated, that uh, women are voting with their feet. I would hope that uh, you know, all women would have an opportunity to uh, this 30,000 that have shown an interest to uh, uh, find it. Uh, less than 1% are African American is uh, relatively disturbing. And in light of that, though, the NCI review has criticized Dr. Fisher's grant proposal for having inadequate plans to recruit minority women to the study. Isn't that correct? That was in the original uh, application. However, that had been that has been corrected. Uh, I, I want to, for the record, say that the NSABP has had an exemplary record of recruiting minority uh, women to their treatment trials uh, and in fact have uh, made some of the major contributions in terms of the differences in uh, black white black white differences in breast cancer treatment uh, and in in uh, our applications in the applications to the participating sites that's why a specific requirement was uh, listed for how they would accrue minority women to the trial so I feel the deficiencies listed in the uh, peer review were corrected. Mr. Chairman, if I might add, uh, I think there is also a new day in clinical trials at NIH. We have um, Dr. Bill Harlan here, who is our new Associate Director for Prevention, but every clinical trial is being scrutinized and criticized from the perspective of adequate diversity, both with regard to women and minority participants. So this trial should be no exception. Okay, though, but in, in spite of that, and I'm, I'm glad that there will be corrections. Uh, you funded the study even though NCI previously rejected a major diet study aimed at preventing breast cancer because of concerns that it may not attract enough poor women and minority women. Isn't that correct? Uh, no, sir, let me correct it. Actually, we have a trial that's in progress called uh, the fe a Minority Feasibility Trial for the Women's Health Trial. So we have in progress at three centers a low-fat dietary trial aimed specifically on reaching minorities, on black populations, Hispanic, and other underserved people. Our aim is to use the information and to invite the women in this trial to participate in the full women's health initiative as it gets underway. But in spite of that, the largest study was rejected. But that larger study was rejected for a number of reasons. Actually, the NCI wanted to do it. It uh, incited a rather heated debate at the National Cancer Board. There were a number of criticisms of the diet hypothesis, which was sort of the central concern 
One of the concerns was whether, um, whether the numbers uh, could be large enough, whether the, in order to make the numbers large enough, whether it would be too expensive. Uh, one of the concerns was about minority participation and whether you could get compliance in the underserved population. And actually what came out of that is the National Cancer Advisory Board, the extramural scientific community and lay body that has to give final approval, said you cannot go ahead with a big trial, but you may go ahead with a trial focusing on minority women. And if you can show that you can bring this kind of diversity, then we will reconsider the bigger trial. All right. Um, well, getting back to NCI, the NCI peer reviewers uh, argued in another light that premenopausal women should not be included in the study. There was concern that the study could be dangerous for them. For example, if they became pregnant, the child could be born with serious birth defects similar to those caused by DES. Uh, isn't that correct? Well, it's, it's correct that that is contained in the peer review statement. Uh, well, I, I have to differ with the statement, however. Uh, Number one, the protocol, again, that was finally developed is substantially different than the document that the peer reviewers uh, reviewed. They reviewed a concept. From that concept came a protocol document and an informed consent. Uh, there was a difference of opinion, but there was concern expressed about the inclusion of premenopausal women who were not at sufficient risk of developing breast cancer. The risk criteria for inclusion of uh, premenopausal women have been uh, substantially increased from that document. And in fact, women 35 years old have to have a lifetime risk of 50% minimum to be eligible to participate in this study. Now, for the DES question, uh, women in this study may not be pregnant. They must say they have no intention of becoming pregnant. They must sign a consent form that cautions them about the uh, potential danger if they do become pregnant. They understand that medication is stopped immediately if they do become pregnant. This is not a situation analogous to DES where the medication was prescribed throughout the course of pregnancy in order to maintain that pregnancy. In this case, the medication would be stopped probably within uh, at most two or three weeks of the conception and would not be started again until the pr uh, pregnancy was carried to term or terminated, depending on the choice of the woman. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to also add generally that too often women are deprived of opportunity because they have the potential to have babies. That often has been true in the workplace, but it has also been the single major reason that people have cited for excluding women from clinical trials. And if we're going to take that attitude generically, we will never study women who are premenopausal in any trials because of the fear that they might have a baby. Because there is absolutely no drug, uh, almost no drug, that doesn't pose some potential risk to that theoretical baby they may have. So that we either are going to say, okay, ladies, you're excluded on that basis, even though you may only have a baby once or twice in your life, or maybe not at all, and we're going to generically exclude all women because of that biological potential, or we're going to deal with it in a responsible way. And I think this study, with a separate informed consent for women who are, but who are premenopausal about their intention not to have children, the fact that they have an obligation to participate in seeing that they don't have children, and if they have any intention of having children or if they become pregnant in the study. They are not participants. But I, I really am concerned that this is being brought up recurrently because it is going to get us back right where we were a few years ago when women were not being included in clinical trials because of their biology. Well, I, I certainly agree with you. I think that women have certainly been discriminated against uh, very clearly in uh, all kinds of tests, uh, not even tests that uh, are, uh, have anything to do with their sex, but uh, I understand that the test done on aspirin had uh, over 22,000 uh, participants. Now, I don't think they have anything to do with pregnancy, but uh, women were totally excluded from the 22,000 persons that were tested uh, on this uh, question of aspirin preventing blood clotting, and, um, and so I couldn't agree with you more that women ought to be uh, included in, in testing. Uh, but I just want to refer to a summary statement by Dr. Ford, who in your 
summary indicated that the study should be limited to postmenopausal women. Now, this is your statement, and I just question that. Um, our original conception of the design of this study, we suggested that it be limited to postmenopausal women or women over the age of 50. That was the uh, implementation plan or the concept that we sent out for people to bid on, if you will, or develop their proposals around. Dr. Fisher has, as you've heard, has more experience with the use of tamoxifen in pre- and postmenopausal women probably than anyone in the country. In the interim between July of 1990 when that statement went out and July of 1992 when we began the trial, there was more information from the B14 trial on premenopausal women. There was substantial information from the British trial in healthy women about its effects in premenopausal women. And there was compelling reasons to include premenopausal women in this study design. Women who are at a 50% lifetime risk of developing breast cancer. If we limited the study to only postmenopausal women, we would still, five to seven years from now, have absolutely nothing to offer these younger women who are at a dreaded risk of developing breast cancer. Can I just add? Yeah, I, let, let me just indicate once again, now this is the peer review group, and this is the memo, the summary I, I that... I did not write that. That is, a, that is called a summary statement. That's we have review. Review and program are totally separated. That is an independent peer review, and that is the summary of an independent peer review body's um, deliberations, uh, which is then provided to Dr. Fisher and to program to help them uh, further develop the research initiative. Okay, well, but your, I, your I, name I, does sit boldly on the top, and it would appear because that it I was, was the program person responsible for mm -hmm. the research project. All right. Yes, you were going to comment. Yes, we did give a great deal of thought to that. For one, when you look at the adjuvant therapy trial, B14, there was a very substantial benefit in the women under age 50. In fact, a bit more than in the older women. Uh, second, the side effects are fewer in the younger women. Third, some of the younger women these are the ones, you know, whose sisters may have breast cancers, who's had multiple biopsies. They're the ones whose other options are watchful for waiting or a surprising number who have had mastectomies for prevention. So we feel we do need the research. And I really would hope, uh, we appreciate your effort at building understanding of breast cancer, but I would hope that at some point you might hear from some of the women who, with full knowledge, entered the trial. Well, and, and, and I, I'm sure that, that it is a traumatic uh, fear that, that women have, yes. and we, we understand that there, uh, and I do recall at the December meeting last year, we indicated uh, that there should be research done, and uh, the late Chairman Weiss um, indicated that we wanted to see um, um, uh, s clinical tests and, and so forth, but uh, by the same token, I'd just like to mention it. Uh, isn't this a particular problem, though, as we're talking about this premenopausal women, uh, since tamoxifen might cause a woman to become fertile, and women participating in this study specifically are not allowed to use birth control pills or IUDs? It, uh, yeah, it takes a tremendous commitment on the part of the woman who chooses to participate knowing that those are the, the limitations. Uh, tamoxifen does not, does not interrupt the normal um, fertility cycle or the normal menstrual cycle, and these women will ovulate. It does not induce a premature menopause. Uh, their estrogens are still there, and uh, it takes a tremendous commitment on the part of the woman and uh, a commitment on our part to, or the investigators' part, to fully inform them of the risks and benefits. But as I said, if a woman became pregnant, the medication would be stopped immediately. But the, uh, which may then be too late, the... Um... There is no evidence to indicate, no scientific evidence to indicate that uh, that would be too late. There have been uh, one report of rat rib abnormalities when given tamoxifen over an extended period of time. 
Okay, I said it may be too rats. late, but let me just... Uh, rats, I'm sorry. Mm, okay, let me just uh, mention that, unfortunately, and maybe it's one of the reasons why women are uh, rushing to, um, to um, participate. Uh, not all the consent forms include information about birth control. Uh, many, many of the hospitals that are participating are Catholic hospitals, and they, they are in local IRBs, and it is up, it, they have the discretion, will not uh, include information about birth control. Let but, me add that. Uh, but they all, they all have pregnancy precautions in their, um, there were two centers that we identified that did not have a pregnancy precaution and their accrual has been stopped and all women that were accrued in those centers will sign a new informed consent before any new accessions can be uh, allowed. But when you started, you were aware that a Catholic hospital might not talk about uh, birth control, but you went ahead and allow them to participate. But they still counsel women against, these women say that they don't want to become pregnant. Many of them practice natural family planning, and that's what they filled out on their forms. Um, we don't require a certain form of birth control. We caution the women and urge them not to become pregnant, and they affirm that they have no intention of becoming pregnant. Yeah, well, they, they say many pregnancies are unwanted. I mean, but I'll just say again, the drug would be stopped immediately mm -hmm. if that happened. All right, well, we'll move on. Um, this morning we heard testimony that there are no published studies showing that tamoxifen is effective for preventing tumors in the second breast of young women with breast cancer. I understand there is one study not published yet which shows it may work for young women with estrogen receptor positive tumors but many premenopausal women have receptor negative tumors. Dr. D. Gregorio this morning testified that new research shows that tomographin may increase the risk of breast cancer in young women. Are you aware of that newly publicized uh, research? We know uh, what he wrote. I believe the information you just stated is incorrect. For one, uh, the B14 trial showed a clear benefit against breast cancer in the opposite breast in women under age 50. Mm -hmm. Second, we know of no research data whatever that shows that tamoxifen may increase the rate of breast cancer. It is possible that there could be some selection that the tamoxifen could prevent the estrogen positive tumors, but we really know of no data to support that contention. All right, well, the study um is a result of a cancer research campaign, adjuvant trials, and it goes on. This is um, a, a very recent study that's come out. So we uh, No, sir. I believe you're talking about a study headed by Dr. Trevor Powell's in England, which no. is, that's the major British prevention trial with tamoxifen. It's the only one, to my knowledge. Yeah, this is... Um, uh, Michael Baum and uh, Joan Sorry. Hawkton and yeah. uh, Diane Riley. In that study, uh, what was shown is that in premenopausal women, uh, there was no difference. I think there was one more case or two more cases of breast cancer of the opposite breast in uh, premenopausal women. However, it's clearly stated in there that there is no power to, uh, there's no statistical power, or that is an event that could have happened by chance alone, and the overall rate of decrease of uh, contralateral breast cancer is significant. In the B14 trial, the uh, rate of decrease of contralateral breast cancer in premenopausal women is almost 70 percent, although our overall effect is closer to 50 percent. Uh, but again, for the same reason, we, don't, we would never presume a 70% benefit because statistically you can't say that that might not just be by chance, but the overall effect is clearly there. Okay, well I, I will certainly uh, make this available to you yeah. uh, no, at I, the end of the meeting because you're incorrect, but I'll leave it with you. Sir, I, I talked with the investigators in that study last week. And I believe we're accurate, but we'll look at that with interest. It's, it's here. As a matter of fact, okay. you can even come up and see it now if you'd like. But, but I do think the one thing that's incontrovertible, Mr. Chairman, is that there is a body of evidence which shows that premenopausal women do have benefit. 
Now, what we learn in, in science is that there may be another study that challenges that, but we are not going into this without a solid body of evidence that offers promise for younger women. Okay. How many studies have proven that? The, the, there are s seven large studies that should taken together show a decrease in contralateral breast cancer. Two of them had uh, significant, no, none of them had a significant number of premenopausal women to do separate analyses and say with statistical confidence that the effect is the same in pre and post. They all showed an overall decrease. We're, we're talking about premenopausal. What, what have you shown with that? As I said, in the B14 trial, it shows a 70% decrease in contralateral breast cancer in premenopausal women. The BAM study shows no difference as far as I uh, know the data. Let, let me just add that the evidence we have from the therapy trial is a solid suggestion of a benefit to the premenopausal women. The fact that, it's, that there's still not absolute proof is the reason we need to do a trial. Okay, yeah. The purpose of a trial is to find out the best truth we can before there's public adoption. And we think the risk of public adoption, as the head of the APHA said uh, today, is real. And that makes it urgent to keep the trial underway for all those populations that may, in the long run, potentially benefit from the agent. Um, the, uh, the bomb study, though, followed uh, longer their, their uh, sampling, and I, I, uh, how long did you follow in the studies that you're referring to? The, the average follow-up on the NSABP trial is now uh, six or seven years. Yes. Let me say, uh, the U.S. trial started in 1984. The, what you're referring to is the Baum trial, although Powell's is a PI. That started in 1986. They did not... Oh, oh, we're talking about the treatment. Oh, I'm sorry. I was talking about the British Prevention Trial. Yeah, no. Well, well, we'll just proceed on. Um, several witnesses this morning agreed with the NCI peer reviewers that the premenopausal study should not, uh, that premenopausal women should not be in the study uh, since they are less likely to um, benefit from tamoxifen. We also have a letter from Dr. Lynn Rosenberg, president of the Society for Epidemiology, uh, epidemiological research urging that premenopausal women be excluded from the study and yet approximately 40 percent of the women in the study so far are premenopausal. Uh, is, is that correct? Yes. Why, why did you overrule the objection of the peer reviewers to include premenopausal women? I don't believe we over... We went through a very extensive review process uh, starting with initial concept development and program planning, beginning with the, the therapy study work in 1984. There was full discussion with our boards of scientific counselors, the National Cancer Advisory Board. There was a lot of debate on this issue. We felt the compelling things were the advantage in the U.S. study to premenopausal women, the uh, lower risk of side effects to premenopausal women, the fact that the premenopausal women had very few other options, basically watchful waiting or mastectomy. Some of them are taking that lat latter option with all of its complications and problems of quality of life. So there was a great deal of deliberation and consideration by us, I believe by the FDA, and by many scientists across the country in making this difficult decision. So far, we've been talking about the concerns of NCI peer reviewers. Uh, but Dr. Peck, let's uh, talk about FDA. FDA reviewers also had serious criticism of the study. They criticized the study for including women who were not at a very high risk for breast cancer. Again, Dr. Lynn Rosenberg, the president of the Society for Epidemiological Research, agrees that women in the study should, have, should be at higher risk for breast cancer. Isn't it true that enrolling higher risk women would make it easier to determine whether tamoxifen is effective or not effective or a degree of effectiveness? <clears throat> it, 
it's certainly true that uh, within our staff and within the uh, our advisory committee, uh, there has been significant debate over the months in, the, in, in which this has been reviewed regarding the issue of uh, premenopausal uh, inclusion of premenopausal women. And as you've uh, had amply displayed before you this morning, this is the nature of science in a state of uncertainty, where the stakes are very high. Uh, we have a process uh, by which we discuss such matters in open forum. And uh, in July of 1991, uh, this was discussed in open forum among many uh, internationally acclaimed experts in the field. Uh, and uh, subsequent to that, we received communications from our advisory committee members in terms of their reactions to uh, further adjustments in the protocol. Uh, we, in, in time, uh, agreed that the inclusion of premenopausal women in the protocol was, uh, was uh, scientifically sound in terms of generalizability and in terms of uh, enabling a statistically powerful study. And in terms of generalizability, uh, to those many women out there who are in uh, the premenopausal years. And I should tell you, I think, why we feel comfortable with this. This protocol, as I said, is a model protocol. It has been through more peer review uh, publicly uh, and in the hands of experts than any protocol that I personally know of. It has very significant safety features that haven't really been emphasized so far. For example, these women will all be very intensely monitored for every one of the serious uh, side effects that uh, have been raised uh, as concern. Every six months in this trial, all of the data that's accrued will be summarized and made available uh, to the uh, responsible parties. Every year, there will be a full statistical analysis to determine whether the objectives of the protocol have already been achieved. There's no doubt in our minds that uh, if during the course of this study an imbalance occurs in, in favor of or uh, that, that in, indicates that the drug is too toxic, uh, that the protocol will be closed down, that if, the, uh, if there is a uh, market advantage for those women who are taking tamoxifen in terms of prevention of breast cancer that shows up early on, the, the, drug, the, the study will be terminated. So, uh, there are very significant safety features of this experimental effort, this uh, controlled clinical trial, that provide appropriate safeguards for the inclusion of premenopausal women. All right, um, but isn't it true that the risks of serious side effects could be easily just easier justified if the women, as I indicated earlier, were at a higher risk of breast cancer rather than the group that you will deal with? I think that's always the case. And um, uh, certainly if a woman already has cancer, uh, there's no doubt that the potential benefits outweigh the, outweigh the risk. However, if we demurred from engaging in scientific study with all of the appropriate monitoring and safeguards, then we would never know and it may well be that many women will be subjected to the unknown benefits and the significant potential risks of this drug by their, by their physicians uh, in, the, in this state of ignorance. But uh, Dr. Greenwald testified uh, that, you know, 30,000 women uh, voted with their feet that uh, you, you could, it seems to me that uh, there is a tremendous amount of uh, interest in the study and uh, listening to the testimony that uh, it would not be difficult to get uh, the proper number of persons who would be more susceptible. Um, why, with that knowledge, uh, I'm just kind of confused at why, uh, why you uh, ignored the, uh, the advice that uh, was given. I don't believe we have ignored any advice. Uh, it's our business to solicit and take into advice from all corners. And as I say, we, we typically do that in public. And exactly these issues were debated in public uh, and have been considered by all of, the, all of our counselors and all of the designers of this protocol. And uh, in order to enable generalizability uh, to make the, the value of this trial be um, applicable to premenopausal women, uh, 
the final decision uh, was that premenopausal women of very high risk, risk equivalent to a woman of 60 years of age or greater, uh, would be included in the trial. All right. Um, the, uh, the, the model consent form, get back to that, approved by NIH for Dr. Fisher's studies, states that researchers believe that approximately 62 breast cancers and 52 heart attacks can be prevented over the next five years. Dr. Greenwald, uh, would you, uh, how, how many controlled studies of women showed that tamoxifen would prevent heart attacks? Sir, a, a clinical trial is based on a, hy a hypothesis. The evidence behind this is mainly the impact on lipid lowering and what we know from many heart disease trials of how that is associated with changes in heart attack events. So that's the basis. We think that that likely gain has to be put to the test in a clinical trial. And thus, this is the trial that will test out the potential for, for achieving the benefit that we think is likely. But uh, if almost half of the women in the study are premenopausal, yeah. the number of women saved from heart attacks will be lower, uh, wouldn't you say? Uh, that's true, yes. And, and some of the heart attack endpoints might be later. The primary consideration and design had to do with breast cancer prevention, uh, even though we, thi we think that we will have a good amount of information related to heart disease prevention and preventing progression of osteoporosis. Right, in the, uh, the review of Dr. Bretz's protocol, FDA demanded that eye exams be done because tamoxifen can cause eye damage. This seems very appropriate to me also. Uh, so let me ask you, Dr. Peck, are eye exams demanded of the current NCI study conducted by Dr. Fisher? I, I believe they are, but I'd like to ask Dr. Burke to elaborate on that. Uh, clinical uh, eye exams are being performed. In addition, the NSABP is planning uh, additional parallel satellite type of uh, investigations in subsets of patients to specifically look at that issue uh, with uh, greater detail in a subset of the patients. Well, then why, why were, weren't they mentioned in the model informed consent form or protocol? There, there is a section in the model informed consent that speaks to uh, isolated cases of eye toxicities. Uh, the recent report from Greece of four out of 63 women uh, adds four more cases to about the three or four that were, have been reported in the literature since, uh, since tamoxifen has been in use. But we do plan a major study of long-term uses of tamoxifen and women that have been on placebo. Uh, and women that have been on tamoxifen for long term and then for five years and then gone off to, s to uh, see the real um, rate of eye toxicities with this agent. But we're, we're talking about eye exams. That you, you're saying that eye exams... At exam each follow-up visit, women are asked about their, uh, any changes in visual acuity. They're given a questionnaire about that uh, is specifically has been validated to pick up changes, retinal changes. Women with a history of macular degeneration are being excluded from this study as a result of the recently published article. Uh, and if women have had op complete ophthalmologic exams in between visits, all of those records are obtained. If there are any complaints of visual acuity, they will have a complete ophthalmologic exam. We've been advised by our uh, colleagues at the National Eye Institute that some of the changes described in this one article in four patients uh, could not be diagnosed on a routine ophthalmologic <coughs> exam. And so that's why we're trying to target those women and find out what the real rate of uh, occurrence is. Mm -hmm. But don't you think it would be appropriate for it to be on a consent form? Well, there is a section on the consent form cautioning about eye problems. But it doesn't require eye exams. Uh, sir, let me add two points. There is a part, part which we just confirmed on the informed consent. We do exclude people that have had the problem. 
There are questionnaires about it. The type of thing reported, which may just occur normally with age, uh, our experts on eye disease uh, were very skeptical about. There were no photographs in that report. And it's something that takes a real specialist to pick up, not even the average ophthalmologist. Because of that, we have designed, and there is uh, beginning, a study of a, a large enough group of people to get a definitive answer, to be sure there's no problem. But we don't believe that there's a likely problem. All right. Um, we uh, have heard that tamoxifen, tamoxifen can also cause uterine cancer. Um, Dr. Greenwell, why don't you continue? Our uterine uh, biopsies required of all participants prior to enrollment in the study? No, no. no that, that, that's left up to the discretion of the woman and her physician. Uh, we do require um, investigation of any reports of abnormal bleeding and again at the discretion of the woman and her doctor uh, for the, the medication, no, excuse me, let me correct that. Medication, if there are cases of abnormal bleeding, medication is stopped until the case is fully worked up, which may include a, a uterine biopsy if that's what's felt to be necessary. And uh, the medication is not continued again until uh, the problem is resolved. In addition, we require annual uh, exam, gynecologic exams for all women on the study in addition to any interim reports of abnormal bleeding. Uh, I, I'd like to add also for the record that there have been no reported cases of endometrial cancer in premenopausal women. I would also like to add, Mr. Chairman, that uh, the uterine cancer rate, which is uh, specifically listed in the consent form as well, um, is uh, just about the same level as the risk for women taking um, estrogen replacement therapy post-menopausally. Uh, we think that there are somewhere between 8 and 10 million women who are taking estrogen therapy, uh, and it is not routine medical practice that those women have uh, endometrial biopsies when they're given that therapy. They do have annual examinations, which uh, should pick up any abnormality, a more routine uh, exam to pick up an abnormality in uterine size. All right, Dr. Greenwald, Dr. Ford, um, are there requirements that mammograms uh, be performed by a board-certified radiologist? If not, uh, why not? The institutions that are participating, these 270 centers across the country, actually 118 nuclear centers and then sub-centers, have had a long track record in participating in uh, NCI-sponsored clinical research. Uh, these are known investigators. They have participated in breast cancer research. They, in their applications, uh, I believe, were asked uh, about uh, the, uh, their facilities for mammograms, for following up women. Any abnormal mammograms, I believe, are sent in for central reading, aren't they? Yeah. Uh, so there is not, it, it is implicit in the selection of the sites and in the training of the uh, participants that they be read by board certified radiologists. And as I said, any abnormal findings would be sent for central reading. Let me add our general experience, and I think one of your panelists said something like this earlier. There's an advantage to being on a clinical trial in that you tend to get the best of medical care. Uh, that in many of our, our therapy trials, we found that whichever arm of the study people went on, even the placebo, they tended to get good medical care and do better than people in the population at large. We'll assure that in this case, they get top-notch medical care. All right, um, the, uh, the model informed consent form approved this past spring states that the only evidence that tamoxifen causes liver damage is from rat studies with extremely high dosages of the drug. And yet in April, a respected medical journal reported five deaths due to liver problems associated with tamoxifen, as well as 17 other serious cases. Our witnesses are concerned about the animal studies showing liver tumors and testified that the human studies of liver cancer are not relevant because no one has studied women for the 20 years it takes for liver cancer to develop. The model consent form was finally changed this summer to indicate possible liver damage, but it still says that liver problems experienced by 
tamoxifen patients may not be a direct result of the tamoxifen treatment. Shouldn't an informed consent form be more honest in describing the potential risks, even if the research is not yet conclusive? Uh, we feel the revised informed consent form does adequately describe the potential risk. Uh, there is no evidence, and in fact, when the, the um, records of some of those six cases that were reported in a letter to The Lancet that was not a peer-reviewed article but a letter in their correspondence section, uh, in fact, several of the women had been on other medications. They had metastatic breast cancer and were severely ill. Uh, there is no evidence that those six cases were directly attributable to the tamoxifen, although they might be, and that's why we revised our consent form to indicate that. In addition, the two liver cancers that did develop, developed within two years of the women being on tamoxifen. The two liver cancers that developed in a study using 40 milligrams, which is double the dose, but those also are indicated in our consent form. The consent form, uh, staying with that, also reads the tamoxifen may be related to the occurrence of 38 uterine cancers and three deaths due to blood clots in the lungs. Uterine cancer can cause death as well, isn't that correct? That's correct, but there has been no case of a death due to liver cancer in any of the studies that we... Uterine, uterine cancer, yeah. And we, we, as you can see, we're attempting to um, really uh, try to have everyone totally informed as to the downside of this uh, study. We, as we indicated before, we're 100% supportive of an attempt to come up with some solutions, but we feel that uh, since there is so much interest that uh, the more information that a uh, person knows. I think that it would uh, serve the uh, study well to have a more documented, uh, uh, not pulling the wool over anyone's eyes type of a situation. And uh, it just disturbs me that, that after some things that are uh, basically known, that it, it takes a little time for an adjustment to, uh, to come about on, on forms. Um, Mr. Chairman, I think there's a very important generic point that you're making, which is the, is the responsibility of a physician to inform their patient before any therapy occurs, and the added responsibility that one has as a clinical scientist who is dealing with human subjects to put all of the uncertainties on the table, which are going to be even greater in an experimental therapy, and we agree with you wholeheartedly. I have personally, in preparing for this hearing, read the consent form and, uh, and asked about how they were dealing with the new reports. Remember, this, this, this trial is going to go on for many years, and it is likely that over that time, reports, case reports, letters, whatever, will come forward, which might describe other problems with this, and it is the responsibility of the team of physicians and scientists at the NCI that you see here to look at those and then to convey that information back to patients even after they have signed an initial consent form. And it is part of the routine practice in this trial that the consent forms will be updated and even people who are already in it will be provided the new information uh, and they will have, based on that new information, the option to pull out of the trial. And we have as a standard part of all consent forms in all clinical investigation, and I have done clinical investigation for 20 years, it is routine in, in, in uh, clinical investigation, informed consent, to say up front to the patient that you may withdraw from this study at any time for any reason, and we will still care for you. I mean, it, does not, uh, it is not a negative thing for them to do. So patients will be informed. We have an obligation to do that. You are absolutely right on that regard. Um, and, um, and this trial, as far as I can determine, based on the documents I've seen, is doing it splendidly. But it seems strange that a prerequisite for the uh, form uh, would not be that the forms should come to your office and someone review. I understand that they're not required. Uh, you do get a chance to review them, but it's not a prerequisite. And that, to me, seems to be a little bit odd. Well, I think that uh, there, there is an issue here. Um, uh, and let me go back a little bit, and that is that, of course, within the, centrally within NIH, there is an Office of Research Risks, OPRR, 
which oversees all human subjects consent forms, guidelines. Uh, it has the elements that must be in any consent form. It also more broadly deals with all issues having to do with human investigation. You probably know that NIH played a role in developing the model policy, which is now used throughout the entire government. Actually, many years ago when I was at OSTP, I participated in the early development of the model's policy. In fact, our policy is used worldwide. Uh, and every year, at all times, OPIR is there as a standing office with ethicists and with, with scientists, um, always looking at how we can do it better. And, uh, and I think that we do have a mechanism for auditing. The National Cancer Institute actually happens to do a superb job of auditing all of their clinical centers on a routine basis, which includes looking at informed consent. We think from this experience with 270 participating centers, that we are going to, uh, to embark on a more aggressive auditing procedure for looking at the variance among the different centers. Informed consent documents often do have to vary from different centers. Sometimes they have to be written in a foreign language. Sometimes they have to be written uh, in some of the, um, the style that would be uh, more uh, intelligible or more understanding to a particular population. Sometimes they have to be in very large type. They have to vary depending upon the community that they are uh, going to be uh, used in. But certain required elements, there are eight required elements that must be there. Uh, and I think that one thing that the NCI is committed to doing in this trial uh, is to be more aggressive in auditing each one of the individual informed consents, not only for those elements, but for any tone changes that have occurred from the model policy that might raise some of the concerns that you're bringing up. Okay, as you can see, we are, we are very concerned about the consent form, and, and uh, uh, since we've been talking about the uh, model informed consent form, um, I've heard several questions about the actual informed consent form used mo at more than 300 medical centers that are participating in the study, and as we indicated, they, they vary. Uh, let me just say that many of the centers have forms that, as you've indicated, that are very different, uh, different uh, model forms, and my concern was that they were not looked at centrally. In fact, one medical center has a consent form that is only one page long compared to seven pages for the model form. Uh, so I think it is up to each center to develop their own consent form is that correct? Is that where they're yeah. emanating from? Is there yes, an overall uh, prototype that's sent out? Oh, okay. Fine. Dr. Puglisi is from OPRR. It is the case that although a model consent form is reviewed extensively and sent out to each individual participating center, the Institutional Review Board at that individual at each individual center has ultimate responsibility for reviewing and approving an informed consent document to be used at that center. The, I, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. When, we, when OPRR and NCI learned that there may be some difficulties with the informed consent documents used at individual centers, NSABP and OPRR simultaneously began a review of all of the informed consent documents used at each individual site. We found that there was um, a relatively small number of cases, there were a relatively small number of cases where the, mo where the individual informed consent documents failed to satisfy the minimal regulatory requirements in that they failed to reference one or more of the serious risks that was contained in the model. Upon learning that, NSABP, in conjunction with OPRR, has suspended accrual of subjects at each of those sites, approximately 6% of the sites, until those, model, until those individual informed consent documents are repaired. In addition, NSABP has informed in writing all of the performance sites of the requirement to keep in the local informed consent document all the risks contained in the NCI model. Now, OPRR believes that this, even though it is 
uh, a case that has apparently occurred in a relatively small number of centers is one that deserves even more attention than that. We believe that the individual informed consent documents should by and large contain all of the information in the model documents and that revisions made by the individual centers should be either additions of information or attempts to make the information more understandable to the subjects at the individual sites. As a result, OPRR will be requiring that the local IRBs at all institutions participating in NIH-initiated multicenter trials receive a copy of the full NCI protocol and the full model informed consent document that investigators justify any significant modifications of the information in that model informed consent document that the local institutional review board review and approve those modifications and that IRB minutes reflect the modifications and their justifications. In addition, NCI will require that the group headquarters be notified of any substantive modifications in model informed consent documents as they are used at individual sites. In addition, we're exploring with NCI the options for expanding their current system of audits in order to be able to identify more quickly any local sites that may not be using an appropriate informed consent document. Okay, uh, the, but prior to, well, first, how did you find out that uh, there was some flaws in the uh, informed consent uh, forms? I mean, this wasn't a, uh, an initial practice, was it, to review these forms? That's correct. OPRR has not received any complaints from individual subjects about any aspect of this trial. And that is the way we usually become involved in evaluating the human subject protections at a particular institution. Right, but how would a person know what to be complaining about or Each worrying about if, if if it didn't say, do you know that this new medicine may uh, cause you uh, sleepless nights or something? I mean, how, how would a person know what, to, to, what, what issues to raise if, if on a form it doesn't allude to the fact that even though we don't have precise information, uh, this may cause whatever? I mean, how, how would they know? Certainly it is essential that the informed content informed consent documents at each site contain the appropriate information. It is also essential that individual investigators, when they're enrolling subjects, provide um, an informed consent process that is adequate. Each informed consent document must contain the name of a contact person through which the individual can obtain more information if the individual has any questions. That contact person should be prepared to put the individual in contact with either institutional officials who have responsibility for monitoring human subject protections at the institution or for OPRR if there's a serious complaint. But isn't Individual it institutions should be instructing their investigators and, and it is part of our requirement for individual institutions who have assured us that they are fulfilling their responsibilities under the regulations. Each individual institution is responsible for ensuring that there are contact people that individual subjects can approach if they have questions or potential problems about a study. Mr. Chairman, it's customary in multi-center clinical trials funded by NIH that the scientist responsible, the chairman of the study, uh, and uh, the central coordinating group review um, all of the informed consents. And it's my understanding I've been told that Dr. Fisher reviewed all of these informed consents. He's the head of the study. Uh, OPRR typically gets involved when there is a problem. It is a central office. One of the things that has been under discussion is whether or not, in addition to the, um, to the study chairman uh, and their offices reviewing all of the informed consents, uh, that uh, in addition there might be a spot audit added onto that, in addition to the annual review that the NCI conducts. 
but it is routine. And certainly every clinical trial that I've been involved in, not in cancer, but in other fields, uh, the informed consent has, has had a requirement for central review. Well, I think that in this particular instance, um, there, there was a uh, uh, flawed uh, process because it wasn't really until the subcommittee uh, requested copies of the form that uh, that this scrutiny began and secondly uh, Dr. Fisher uh, uh, didn't even have the forms to our knowledge so it would have been difficult for him to review them. I, I think that your department might be the one that could best um, answer that question Dr. Pelosi. Yeah, uh, let me uh, respond to that. Uh, the initial request from the subcommittee came just as accrual was starting. Dr. Fisher does something that uh, many other investigators that don't do and that's actually that's as of now not required in that he collects the actual signed informed consent from each woman that goes on the study uh, what is required is a notification a form that the informed consent was signed but he has the actual documents uh, accrual to this study didn't start until june first at that time he did not have the informed consents from every single center in his possession. But as of now, he does, because every center has put on at least one person, and they have reviewed every form, and they have suspended accrual where the uh, informed consents are not adequately informing women. And they will collect the revised forms before accrual can be reopened. Right. We, we understand that there has been improvement, but um, NIH provided 268 of these consent forms to the subcommittee. Uh, of that number, we found two-thirds failed to accurately describe at least one important risk, as we're talking about before. Uh, for example, 62 percent failed to provide complete warnings about blood clots and similar risks. In many cases, they didn't mention that two tamoxifen uh, patients had died from such problems and that three of the women participating in this study are expected to die from such complications. Are you aware of those problems with the uh, informed consent forms and has that been corrected? We are aware that although some sites have documents that technically meet the minimum regulatory requirements, they are not as good as they could be. And, and it is also correct um, to point out that because of this particular situation, we have become aware of a possible loophole in the system that we are acting vigorously to correct. That is the reason that we will require investigators to make a substantive justification for any deviation in the information that's provided in the model document. That is the reason that IRBs will ha local IRBs will have to review that information that is the reason the justification will have to be provided in the IRB minutes, and that is the reason that NCI will require that those modifications be forwarded to the Central uh, Cooperative Group Office for review. Uh, in the warning about uterine cancer, are you aware that half of the centers failed to explain that uterine cancer is treated with a hysterectomy? Are you aware of those omissions in the informed consent forms? I don't have a list with me now of all the deficiencies that we found or the, uh, the changes that were found in individual informed consent documents. We recognize that some are not as good as they could be and we are going to act vigorously to correct that situation. I'd also are you aware that half of the centers misrepresented the dangers of liver damage either by uh, not mentioning that tamoxifen has caused liver cancer in rats or misrepresenting the relevance of the animal research? Twenty-six percent actually failed to uh, warn women that they cannot use birth control pills or IUDs while participating in the study. And let me just ask this, what will NIH or NCI do about these problems with the informed consent form that are being used across the country? I understand that you have put in some, uh, some safeguards, but uh, we think that this is very, very essential and it goes to the core of the matter as to the questions that should be raised prior to a person participating, uh, these 30,000 uh, women who, as it was indicated, are voting with their feet. 
do they know all of this information is and uh, are they um, the revised forms clearly indicating this we believe that the revised model document does mm -hmm. accurately represent the risks to women as dr. Healy mentioned every participant in this study will have the opportunity to view the new informed consent documents and to decide whether or not to continue participating in light of the new information that's been provided. In instances where informed consent documents were deemed to be deficient, individual participants will also review the new approved informed consent document and have the opportunity to decide whether or not to continue participating. All right, let me ask you this. Um, there, are f there are three studies showing tamoxifen helps prevent osteoporosis of the spine, which is not fatal and not usually related to bone fractures. There are five studies showing no impact of tamoxifen on bone density, which is related to fractures. The informed consent form says that tamoxifen may prevent bone fractures, but there really are no studies showing that. Are there? Uh, tamoxifen is an agent that, uh, as you may know, has both estrogen and anti-estrogen properties. We initially in this study uh, were very concerned about um, what it might do to bone mineral density as an anti-estrogen working in a bad way. In the process of designing the study, some preliminary reports came out that indicate that, in fact, it might imp improve the status of postmenopausal bones or bones in postmenopausal women, the bone density, uh, and at least it stabilizes it. It is um, incumbent upon us to collect data on bone fractures in this study that could either be a risk or a benefit, and we must know the information. From the most recent reports, we uh, think it is going to be a benefit. In addition, we are working closely with the uh, Institute on Arthritis and Musculoskeletal Diseases, and we are going to be doing a detailed study in a subset of the women following them from premenopause into postmenopause to see exactly what happens to the normal bone resorption as women age versus women on this agent. Mr. Chairman, I would also like uh, to add that we shouldn't minimize the, uh, the fact that osteoporosis' effect on the spine is highly debilitating. In fact, there are stress fractures that women with osteoporosis of the spine do get. They, they, uh, their spine collapses. They get thoracic deformities, which can lead to pulmonary complications and respiratory complications. The back uh, problems and the back fractures can lead to hospitalizations and entrance into nursing homes. I think to trivialize that consequence of osteoporosis is a rather cruel trivialization of the suffering of millions of older women in this country. Well, I didn't uh, characterize it as trivializing it. Uh, I just wanted to get some information on the record as to uh, the uh, rationale. No, but it was trivialized by one of the earlier panels this morning, uh, earlier today. Okay, well then we should refer it to them. I wanted to react to that very briefly myself. Uh, as Dr. Healy just eloquently indicated, uh, Osteoporosis of the spine is a, is a devastating condition of uh, primarily elderly women and does result in fractures. They're called, uh, they're called stress fractures or compression fractures and they lead often to the most uh, poorly treatable, intractable pain known to man. Woman. Woman. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, Dr. Greenwald, one of the few major cancer prevention projects funded by NCI is the ASSIST program, which was to be a seven-year, $135 million attempt to prevent lung cancer. ASSIST is targeted at poor urban populations, including my own state of New Jersey and New York, and will include many minorities. The goal of ASSIST was to prevent more than one million lung cancer deaths, as we know that in uh, urban areas, uh, cigarette companies advertise heavily in urban areas and minority people in particular African Americans tend uh, to smoke more heavily or new smokers are in that community. Uh, since the study was aimed at preventing children from starting smoking, 
and helping adults to stop smoking, there were no risks to the participants in the program. Is that correct? That's true. Yes, sir. All right, Dr. Greenwald, then at the same time that NCI put together the $60 million study for tamoxifen, it cut the assist budget by 25 percent. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, let me just uh, tell you what happened to the budget. Uh, because the assist was well funded in fiscal year 1992. And the changes in the budgeting had to do with how well the participating centers could come online and use the funds. Uh, I appreciate your interest in assist. We're, we think it's an extremely important study. We think smoking is the major preventable cause of death in the United States from cancer, heart disease, and other factors. And I'm delighted at your interest. <laughs> we would like to fully fund it. The major needs for uh, greater budget come in fiscal year 93 and 94 and later years. That is, the project gets scaled up as the groups get ready and, and build their, their process for utilizing the funds. At that, this point, I must say, we're a bit uncertain about what our out-year budgets will be. So we can't make a determination until we see those figures. Okay, I know that uh, Dr. Sullivan um, had a very strong position, but the, uh, looking at the HHS estimates, that that 25% cut will result in close to one half million more deaths from lung cancer. It can be anticipated. Well, it's a reasonable estimate that the, the, the funding is not linear, linearly related to the impact. That is, there's a certain base cost and that as you go up, you get more impact for your dollar. So if we have problems in the out years like FY94, we would have uh, less of an impact. That's true. Well, as I indicated earlier, I certainly um, feel that we should be moving in the direction of, of women's health, and, and so we're certainly uh, uh, sub extremely supportive of uh, what's being attempted, but, and so therefore I don't want to pit one prevention study against another, because I think that prevention of breast cancer and lung cancer are both terribly important. But one of the criticisms of peer reviewers of tamoxifen study was that the government should do a smaller study first to see what happens instead of jumping into a very large, expensive study. This was especially important because of the concerns that the risks would outweigh the benefits. Isn't that correct? We think that we have the smaller studies in the therapy trials showing the benefit in the opposite breast. We also think it's quite likely, unfortunately as happened with estrogen use, that the use of tamoxifen could come into common practice within four or five or more years based on incomplete knowledge, the lack of the gold standard of evidence that we have in a clinical trial. That's why we feel that we need the evidence from a trial for all of the populations that might eventually benefit from the use. If we did the study in a subpopulation, say only those over 60, and showed a clear benefit, and then started eight or ten years from now with a new study for younger women, it would be in wide, wide use before we could ever get that trial done. And the public of the United States would not be as well off as they will be for having this trial. But the, my problem is that we have a, a, um, a study that uh, really could have predicted by the the assist study, uh, actual s saving of lives also, but you know, what, what, it, what it appears to me is that sort of the old cliche is that you, you, you know, you've robbed from Peter uh, to pay Paul, moving the money from a study aimed at saving the lives of more than a million urban poor to a study that includes almost no poor women or minority women. Uh, and so I just wonder on, on what basis did you make that funding decision? Could, could I um, interject a comment here, and that is that, that uh, the decisions are not made um, specifically in that way. I mean, right now, NIH is facing a desperate situation with regard to our budget in 1993. We had $200 million taken out of the President's request by the Congress of the United States, $200 million less to do our work. 
That puts us in a dilemma of making a Sophie's choice every day we're there. Well, I certainly don't support $200 million coming out of the President's budget, um, and so I hope that that can be corrected. Um, the, uh, but we've heard testimony this morning once again on the same subject that uh, there will not be enough minority women in the t tamoxifen study to be able to show whether the drug is even safe or effective with minority women. I understand you're going to try to aggressively get more, but at a 1% number at the current time, there's a, a quantum leap that needs to have uh, to be done. But given the risk of taking this drug, it's hard for me to be enthusiastic really about including more minority women in the studies. I'm really kind of contradicting myself here, but if you believe this study will help prevent breast cancer and if you're going to put some minority women at risk, shouldn't the study include enough minority women to see if the drug works? Because what's the point of including just a few minority women and then not being able to draw any conclusions? I know that uh, it would be an invalid sampling. Yeah, the, the best we can do is to assure that the trial is representative of the population likely to benefit. If we were to do what you're asking, that would mean another trial of 16,000 women. In other words, you can't have an independent subgroup analysis of the same power as the initial study unless you have an equal number of people in it. I'd also like to, to mention that over the past 10 years, we've aggressively built at NCI and at NIH a very strong minority program. We have a national leadership initiative for black populations. We have one for Hispanic populations. We have one for Appalachia populations. We've made sure in our training programs that a good number of people have entered. And there's a broad NIH program to address those needs. Yes, I, I'm certainly aware of the, uh, the new effort. Uh, I know that Dr. Penn came from, Dr. Penn came over from, from Howard University. It just appears to me, though, and, and um, that the 16,000 women are probably almost online, but had the uh, forethought been uh, there in the clear thinking through the project, it would have, uh, it seemed like it would have just come forth that we really don't have a, 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 a true sampling and, uh, and to uh, have this invalid, uh, it, it almost seems that you might have just excluded minority women uh, and, and at some other time do something to, to have such a small number that will put these women at risk and actually conclude nothing with a 1% minority women out of 16,000 that you intend to have, I think that uh, that does a tremendous amount of harm. Mr. Chairman, it's my understanding, unless I have been incorrectly informed, but it's my understanding that it is the intention of this trial to recruit the numbers of women in the proportion in which they are in the population, and that although it may be 1% at this point in time, that they will recruit disproportionately at a time if they have to in order to achieve the appropriate diversity of racial mix in this study in order to make it applicable to the population as a whole. And we believe that if, in fact, we have that appropriate diversity, it will not be 1%. It will be closer to 10% of, pop of the population, and that will be approximately 1,800 minority women, black women, who are um, in the study. We think that will be very meaningful, and, uh, and I find it absolutely absurd to ever think of excluding women from a trial because they're black or because they're poor or because they're rich or because they're young or because they're too old. I mean, we are not in the business of having exclusionary trials anymore. That was the way we used to do business and we've stopped it. Okay, but the, uh, my own point was just that so far you're lagging far behind and I wonder, Dr. Greenwall, what uh, programs or effort, uh, I know it might have been mentioned before, but how then will you intend to get this quantum leap into this study since these women are coming in and voting with their feet so much that yeah. there may not be space left? We accept your criticism, Mr. Payne, and that's why it was brought out, that was brought out to the National Cancer Advisory Board to make sure we brought action on it. Uh, we, a lot, this program is run in large part through the Community Clinical Oncology Program, a network of community physicians that take part in trials, um, plus a broader network uh, connected with, with Dr. Fisher's group. Uh, Dr. Ford, um, 
began several years ago a minority community clinical oncology program to address the type of concern that you are raising. That is, we felt that we did need to encourage more participation by minority physicians, by, by hospitals and medical centers that have uh, more than 50% of their patient load from minority populations. They're, those groups that were funded, there are 10 of them now, uh, are now building to a level and a quality where they can participate fully. It takes some years. It took some years for the general groups. It takes a few years to get up to speed. So we're encouraged that we think it is feasible. We look at the track record of NSABP in therapy trials. It's very good. We look at the, tra the effect that up front we did require in the, in the uh, participation that that be addressed. We do accept that it has not been adequately addressed in the cruel to present. We then called a workshop to make sure it's addressed. And uh, if need be, we'll add on new units to see that's addressed, and we'll keep the trial open until it is addressed. So uh, we take to heart what you're saying. Okay, um, um, Dr. Healy, uh, when the subcommittee staff began inviting and uh, mentioning the scientists from around the country that we wanted, uh, would be interested in them testifying, many expressed serious concerns about this breast cancer prevention study, yet they said they were reluctant to testify because they were afraid their NCI funding would be cut. Now, we know that there are perceptions and there's realities, and so I'm not making an accusation. Whether their fears are well-founded or not, their perceptions of NCI and NIH bothers me, and I'm sure that, you know, if you've heard it before, I, I know it bothers you too. Uh, what assurances can you give scientists uh, that they can freely express their scientific opinions without fear of losing funding. Uh, the fear to speak out against the study is based, I guess, in part of NCI's willingness to ignore the strong recommendations of peer reviewers to exclude premenopausal women, as an example. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, who made the, that particular decision? It, it, I think that the decision making seems to bother people, and secondly, their uh, their fear of coming before um, uh, the committees because of uh, the fear of retribution. Well, let me make a general statement. I think that the fear that because they might criticize anything NIH does would lead to an effect on their funding is, to put it mildly, raving paranoia. And I think that I have plenty of anecdotal practical evidence to support that, and I am a living, breathing example of the fact that people can criticize the NIH all the time without any fear of any kind of, uh, of retribution. NIH is probably the most open agency. We thrive, we breathe, we live on criticism, and actually we take it pretty well and usually and typically change what we do. We have the largest review system, scientific uh, review system in the entire federal government. We have more consultants than anybody else in the department and probably in aggregate the largest advisory system of any other component of government. Uh, and that's because we want criticism. In fact, this particular trial was approved unanimously, Mr. Chairman, by three separate advisory groups. This was not people at the NCI overruling their advisory groups. That doesn't mean there aren't going to be groups in the community who disagree. That doesn't mean there aren't going to be people who are going to question some of the things in this study design, in this study protocol. That kind of criticism occurs whether you're doing basic science or clinical science. And in fact, those critics out there are performing a good role. They will help to participate in the oversight that will occur as we do this re research and do other clinical research. But we cannot be stopped by every criticism. If we are stopped by every criticism, uh, if we can only do trials that have zero criticism, then we will close down virtually all research done by the NIH, because NIH is about moving into areas where there's uncertainty. And I think the most important issue that somehow is being missed in some, among some of the critics is that we are talking about choice. We are talking about providing knowledge so that people can make choices about their lives. Breast cancer has a hideous and embarrassing history of depriving women of options, depriving women of choice and being involved in their own care. I guarantee you, Mr. Chairman, that women are going to go out and use tamoxifen. 
They're going to get doctors who will give them tamoxifen. And what we are hoping to do is to provide, in the nick of time hopefully, the kind of information about the risks, and we agree that there are risks, as well as the benefits, the scientific information, so that we don't see another DES, so that we don't have the problems that the FDA struggled with, with regard to the implant problem. If we had done a clinical control trial, if NIH had supported a clinical trial on breast implants, 20 years ago, the FDA would not have struggled this past year, and women across this country wouldn't have suffered so horribly because devices were put in clinical use without adequate study. And I guarantee you that a randomized controlled trial supported by the NIH of implants in women would probably be subject to some of the same criticisms we're hearing today. They would say, these are normal women. How can NIH support a study putting an implant in a normal woman? That's unethical. And uh, the other complaint that I heard today, which is uh, outrageously inflammatory and inappropriately addressed towards this trial, is that somehow there has never in the history of NIH been any kind of a primary prevention trial that in which normal people are given drugs in order to prevent disease. That is preposterous. What do you think vaccinations are about? What do you think prophylaxis for rheumatic fever is about? Aspirin, the U.S. physician study you referred to, 22,000 normal males were given a blood thinner called aspirin for many, many years. That was normal people and a drug was given to those people. Cholesterol intervention trials, people who are perfectly normal but happen to have an abnormal blood test, a slightly elevated or a majorly elevated cholesterol, they've been given drugs. So this is part of a history of clinical investigation. We're getting better at it, but to say that this trial is somehow unique and different, I think the only thing that's unique and different is that it's about women at last. Mm -hmm. Well, I uh, certainly agree that um at last, it's about women, and um, as I indicated earlier, I uh, was one of those strong critics um, regarding the lack of women and minorities and other people in, criti in uh, clinical tests. Um, but finally, the, uh, I know that uh, NIH and NCI have been under a lot of public pressure um, from the public in general, from women's groups, from Congress, including this particular subcommittee also, to do something about breast cancer. Of course, no one meant that the study should preclude and proceed rather without proper safeguards. How has the pressure influenced NIH's decision to proceed with this enormous 16,000 person study uh, instead of this small pilot study that uh, normally uh, uh, takes place? I, would just someone touched on it before, but if you could once again uh, indicate the the enorm enormous uh, size, 16,000 to start on a study seems large to me. And uh, could someone just indicate how that decision was made to move so quickly on it the study? It is large. It's it's a typical size for some of our prevention trials. The Women's Health Initiative is larger. The aspirin study was 22,000. The uh, equivalent would, study would, in women of beta carotene, alpha tocopherol, and aspirin is 40,000. But would you consider the aspirin study the same magnitude uh, of potential problems? No, as? no, that's why the aspirin study was actually done through the mail to an informed group, physicians and now nurses. This is much more elaborate, and that's why we have this long, long process of having gone through debate, discussion, peer review, advisory committee review, we think we've adequately addressed the need and it was very, very thoroughly reviewed before we took this major but critically important step of a large prevention trial. Well, the only thing I think that, uh, as we indicated earlier, that the witnesses just simply said that um, there were st that studies uh, did not involve giving drugs with such known negative side effects, and I think that may be a difference from some of the other studies that, that you've indicated. Yes, the reason we know so much is because of the therapy trials. In other words, we had a better database for getting into this trial than most previous trials. We had information on what happens in people. We're able to more accurately delineate effects. Uh, there are instances where that wasn't known. For example, on the 
first polio vaccine trial in 1955, a lot of cases of polio were caused in something called the Cutter in incident. That could not be anticipated because they couldn't do the pilot studies. In this case, we've had a good pilot study in a sense, the therapy trials. We really have a very, very valuable database in people that came out of the therapy trials, and it makes us more comfortable about this trial, although we'll never be totally comfortable. And I don't think that we should, you know, we use this word tamoxifen as chemotherapy. Well, you know, so are vaccines, so are vitamins, so are antibiotics, so is aspirin. And we can trivialize aspirin because you can buy it over the shelf. But the fact is, as a cardiologist, I can tell you that for years, aspirin was in study looking at whether or not it could prevent patients who have had heart attacks to have another heart attack. And there were probably hemorrhagic strokes fatal hemorrhagic strokes that may have related to the presence of high-dose aspirin. So aspirin, um, you were worried about two liver cancers, we should worry about two potential liver cancers, but we also worry about hemorrhagic stroke for aspirin. So none of these therapies don't come without some risks, and we have a moral and ethical obligation to understand them, to monitor them, and to inform our patients. And I agree with you completely, Mr. Chairman, we have to always do better on informing our patients and making sure that we inform them in a tailored way so that they can understand precisely what we're talking about. Well, let me uh, once again thank each of the uh, persons participating in this panel. I, in conclusion, still uh, remain concerned about the study. Uh, there is new research that shows potential problems in NIH and NCI and FDA should be interested to learn more. I'm sure that you will be interested. I'm sure some things came out today. I know you will continue uh, to uh, seek uh, more truth. Uh, we look to that sort of cooperation rather uh, than to become defensive about a study. But I urge you to listen to the scientists who are doing research all over the world, as has been indicated in um, England and so forth. And let's listen to some of the outside people rather than only uh, those scientists that are involved in our uh, own study and, and, and are the ones that are disseminating information. I think the broader, the more open, uh, the more willing that people are, as you indicated, no one has the answer or we wouldn't have the problem, but I think that if we become uh, internal and defensive uh, and only listen to those that we've uh, asked to perform the particular project, then we're doing a disservice to the study. And so once again, though, I uh, thank all of the witnesses for coming. I think that we certainly have achieved uh, a great dialogue. The meeting stands adjourned. Go up. Tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, we invite you to join us for a live viewer call-in program as we look at issues affecting the Hispanic American community in this year's presidential election. One of the guests to take your calls for an hour will be Henry Cisneros, the former mayor of San Antonio, Texas. That's a discussion of Hispanic American issues tomorrow night on C-SPAN at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, 4 o'clock Pacific. And if you would like more information about today's hearing on breast cancer research, you can write to the House Government Operations Subcommittee offices in room B372 of the Rayburn House Office Building, Washington, D.C., zip code is 20515. Friday on C-SPAN, meet new members of the 103rd Congress. Democrat Kerry Meek and Republican Lincoln Diaz-Bellart from the Florida State Senate face no opposition.